Well, thank you for coming this afternoon. Almost seems like we just left here a few hours ago. Uh, we're here for our capital improvement workshop. And as soon as I can get the agenda to open up. All right, we will begin with a public comment period. Uh, comments will be limited to five minutes and must be related to something on the agenda, which is fairly large. So anyone wishing to speak in the initial public comment? Please state your name. Good afternoon. Good afternoon for the record, Fred Volz. Uh, looking through the documentation for today's meeting, uh, it really comes across as a Christmas wish list. Uh, anything that seemed to be possible to suggest, it has been. And uh, there's really no justification for any of these projects, not even a one-line item to explain why they are necessary. And looking at the projects uh, for fiscal years 21 through 25, uh, we have $30 million included for a pool when the pool committee has not even met for a first time yet to deliberate about this. And the city went to a consulting firm and had a repair estimate of about 10.4 million, which would seem to be one of the alternatives that we should be considering as a city. Similarly, there are $1 million worth of proposed alterations to this building, completely unjustified. There's a community convention center for $5.5 million. There's a renovation of the city shops, main building, and expansion for a city that's not really growing of $4 million, $400,000 to renovate and uh, expand the dining room at the money-losing Boulder Creek Golf Course, $700,000 for clubhouse renovation at the municipal golf course, uh, $5 million for a new multi-purpose public safety facility. And when you total all of uh, the discretionary items, including the airport, I might add, that's almost $26 million for the same five-year period. Uh, and you take those out of this, you're talking about $71 million of money that does not need to be spent. No idea the condition of the city's utility system and what sort of upgrades that's going to need. Uh, and here we are potentially spending money we really don't have on things we don't need. And going specifically to the fiscal year 2021 proposals, we have $25,000 for landscaping at Boulder Creek Clubhouse entrance, $150,000 for clubhouse renovation, just the design at the municipal golf course. The utility department is looking to increase its capital improvement spending from this year, uh, which was $8.960 million to 10,130,000 for a 13% increase, again, without knowing any of the conditions overall of the utility system or what we're looking at. There's 128,000 for Veterans Park multipurpose field construction, and the Parks and Recreation Department want to spend $70,000 in their administrative offices to renovate the lobby. Uh, people in this town are not interested in spending money foolishly or frivolously, and these are just a small sample of the projects which could not be gone through for five minutes uh, of what's included in today's discussion. And more importantly, uh, as I have sent an email to all of you last week, as well as the city manager and the utilities director, we have a real problem in spending the money timely for the last five years of fiscal year spending on capital improvement projects where we had budgeted some $34 million, I believe, 40, excuse me, and we've only spent just under 14 million for about 34%. And on the spreadsheet that's supposedly justifying these projects, we have problems with completed projects that have no budgets or, or dollar amounts spent. They've not done projects listed with zero dollars. Ongoing projects have no dollars, either budgeted or actual, 
and they've not stated projects where they've spent any, not started projects where they've spent any money. So I think before we look at spending another large sum of money, we really need to be having an accountability system so that we know what's going on with these projects where we're spending millions and millions of dollars and they don't seem to be tracked properly. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in public comment? All right, we'll go ahead and close public comment then and begin the presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, Keegan Luttrell, your Public Works Director. So as we all know, we're here to go over uh, our workshop for the capital improvement plan for next year, and then we'll also highlight some of the projects for the, the future four years. Um, let's start off with general fund requests. In uh, our streets department, every one of those projects are 100% reimbursable by the RTC. Um, we're going to do our annual crack and celery seal program. We've just been spending roughly 500000 in the last few years. Um, as we all know, we just got, we're in the process of doing an assessment of all of our streets. We should be receiving the final report on that here within the next couple of weeks. Um, what I'm typically used to is having a, like a five year or seven year zoned plan. So you can, because slurry usually lasts five to seven years. So you'll have a, a five year or seven year, seven year plan. In order to hit that, and be able to uh, slurry every street or reconstruct every street within that seven-year plan, we're going to have to almost triple that, that program. Um, so we just have 500000 in there right now. That'll, since it is through RTC, if we we're able to do another program this spring, we can go back to RTC and uh, get everything revised that way. But in future years, you'll, you'll see a, quite a bit bigger number on that um, moving forward. And like I said, RTC is paying for that. We have our annual street reconstruction program. We don't have a street specifically picked out right now. Um, when we get that final report from our consultant, then that'll more further define what streets we were gonna, that we're going to reconstruct. Um, we have the pe pedestrian safety upgrades. That's typically so sidewalk or crosswalks, signage, uh, projects such as that. RTC is willing to pay for that. We also have the design for the Railroad Museum Roadway. Um, we're working closely with the Railroad Museum. Um, RTC, when we approached them, they said they'd be more than happy to pay for that roadway that runs along Linear Park. Um, and then we also have the, we actually brought it to you earlier, the traffic signal and intersection improvements. That's the study and design down at Adams and um, Vets Way. We're looking at a study there and possibly some changes there to make it more efficient, safer. And then we're also looking at Arizona and Nevada Way intersection. Um, I'm sure anybody that's tried pulling off of Arizona on a Nevada Way on a, on a busy day, it's pretty hard to see. So we're going to look at our options there. Um, we, are, we already got a funding agreement from RTC from that. We don't know exactly what's going to come out of our, uh, our study. So we're asking for more RTC money through that. Um, continuing to the next page is uh, a few more RTC funded projects. Um, we're going to start picking away at the ADA ramps, um, sidewalks, anything that uh, is in disrepair or needs improvement. Um, and then we're also joining the, the bike path rehabilitation program through RTC. Um, we'll start using either slurry or other types of surface seals to uh, keep them repaired and in good shape. And then uh, I was approached by RTC a few months ago asking when we're going to get started with phase two of the Complete Street Project. Um, they said they have the available funding, so we put the design in here to go from Vets Way out to where the I-11 work stopped. That'll, that's what's considered phase two. We're actually going to try to do the, a lot of that design in-house. We'll probably have to hire a landscape architect, make sure we tie everything together with uh, the project that's going on right now. 
down at the cemetery, we have a, a couple smaller projects. The pavilion down there is uh, in getting to be pretty bad shape. We'd like to repair some of the tile, stucco, new paint job. Um, and then the perimeter wall, we got some cracks and some of the end caps are popping off. Um, so we'd like to get that fixed. And then also the landscaping down there. Um, I've been told that some of the trees and stuff like that is uh, not suitable for that area, not suitable for our climate. So we'd like to uh, install some new trees, shrubs, irrigation systems getting pretty old, um, and uh, some DG for uh, the landscaping. For a uh, general facility, we have uh, the city hall improvements. We have the star beside that. We're waiting on a study from uh, uh, Stantec that's doing our facility-wide study for everybody, or for us. Um, that's why we have the star beside it. We just have the million dollars in there as a placeholder. They're assessing everything for us right now. We're gonna bring that back to council, get your guys' buy-in, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, but we have that placeholder in there because we know we have some, uh, some improvements we need to make. Uh, one one highlight is uh, uh, like a one-stop shop, something where when someone comes into City Hall, they can just walk up to a desk or uh, someone that's there available to answer questions. Right now, someone walks in, I see them all the time, they walk in the front door, they're looking at the signs up, down, they don't know which way to go. If we had a, a, nice, a nice thing for someone to walk up to and get their questions answered, um, that would, I would see that would be very, very beneficial. Um, other improvements on here, uh, we're doing our annual HVAC replacement. In January of 2020, I guess it's gonna be illegal for the R22 systems to be produced or um, sold in the United States. So we're going through our replacement program with that. We have about 46 units left. And now that we're doing these in-house, we're gonna be able to replace quite a bit more a year. Uh, we're averaging uh, about 20 a year right now. Um, so with our in-house staff, we're hoping to be able to bump that up, or I'm confident we are gonna be able to bump that up. Um, we also have the community convention center in there. That would be design work. Um, we've heard in the past that we would like to have something, not, not so much a convention center, but a place that people can go meet, they can have weddings, um, even if maybe even conventions, we could bring people in, they're gonna spend their money here. So we're looking at options with that, possibly uh, combining it with uh, the Boulder Creek um, uh, improvements down there. Um, the sh city shop's main building renovation, we are also waiting on that facility study for that. Um, we know that with the creation of the utilities department, we're, we still work well together. We still utilize some of the same equipment, but we need to ha have our own separation. Right now, the, some of their, uh, their areas are combined or they're not functioning properly. So uh, we feel with that, we're gonna be able to make some improvements to make things more efficient. Uh, and then uh, we also uh, would like to start looking at our city parking lots. Um, we're analyzing all the streets, we're repairing all the streets, the parking lots aren't getting any love, so we want to uh, start repairing those because if those fall apart, we're looking at big dollars. If you put your money into them now, keep them in good repair, it's less money down the road. Unfortunately, uh, our TC doesn't pay for our city parking lots. And then also for the sign shop and the welding shop, uh, they're pretty outdated right now. Um, our guys are making them work, but they're not always efficient. Some things are starting to get substandard, so we wanna make sure that our guys are, are working safe and working efficiently. And I will hand it over to Roger to go over some of the Parks and Recs items. Mr. Hall, before you begin, uh, Madam City Clerk, do we know if Councilman Jorge had intended to call in for this? Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, my name is Roger Hall, Parks and Rec Director for the great city of Boulder City. Have a couple items on the, uh, 
on the screen for you, the pool surge trench. Um, each pool at the Boulder City Pool uh, is surrounded by a surge trench and water is pumped uh, from the filter pit to the surge trench and then it's pushed back to, the f to be filtered in the mechanical room. The material used to seal the block in the interior of the surge trench is deteriorating, causing uh, water to leak from the unprotected block. A uh, new water barrier is needed to be installed to prevent water leaking through the block into the ground. And uh, once we repair the swimming pool um, on the in interior part of the swimming pool, uh, the, the uh, water uh, costs have gone way down. This is the only thing that needs to be done uh, regarding leakage uh, on the surge trench. The second item is the recreation center flat roof replacement. Um, basically, our roof is very old. Uh, it's um, leaking and needs to be replaced. We've, we just repaired some items uh, on the upstairs classrooms, and um, in order to, for it to not, not happen again, we'd like to replace uh, uh, the roof, and that would save the, the wooden floors in, uh, uh, on the old gym and also the office area and the classrooms upstairs. The aquatic filtration system, uh, now that the pool has, um, you know, uh, we went to a bond issue and it was voted down. The filtration uh, system, which is uh, a very important part of the swimming pool, is located in the mechanical room. It's almost 40 years old, poor state of repair. The existing system is an open water system, which houses 44 filter grids which filters the water as it's, come, as it's pumped down into the filter pit. The support system for the grids is deteriorating, it's rusting, the walls in the pit are leaking, and the grids, due to the age, need to be held down with sandbags. Um, in the past uh, couple months, we've had to close the pool on two, two previous occasions where uh, the, sand bed, the, the grids have come up off the, uh, the bottom of the filter grid, in introducing D into this pool, and you couldn't even see the bottom, so we had to close the pool for a couple days until we could get the filter grids back on. It had to be recirculated and, uh, and vacuumed uh, so we can get uh, some good water. Um, the, Yeah. All right. A new grid system, including grid support, is needed for proper operation of the pool. Forty-four new grids will also be need to be purchased, uh, and the walls need to be repaired and sealed so water uh, doesn't leak through it. Uh, Boulder Creek. Uh, 25 gently used golf carts are needed at the Boulder Creek to handle the demand for golf tournaments and uh, new disc golf program. It's not uncommon for um, around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock that we have no carts at the golf course because they, they've all been rented out and, and people have to wait until the cart comes in. It has to be serviced real quick and then pushed back out to the public. If we get 25 uh, gently used, we can rent them and it, they, they would pay for themselves in a very short time. The clubhouse entrance landscape, as you enter the front doors of the Boulder Creek Clubhouse, you'll, you'll notice somewhat of a large rock area to the left of the door. There are no plants, trees, shrubs, or flowers located in this area, and it's not very appealing to our golf customers. We'd like to improve this area to attract the golf customers to Boulder Creek. Uh, irrigation nozzle heads, um, the, the current irrigation nozzle heads were installed almost 20 years ago. It seems impossible. But uh, the life expectancy is approximately 15 years. New nozzle technology improves irrigation efficiency on the golf course, and these nozzles will be put on each of the uh, irrigation heads on the course. The tree line valve and Y strainer replacements um, were installed in 2002. They're failing and need to be replaced. Brass valves will, will last longer and will have a lasting fix to this problem. Okay. The uh, replacement of the uh, Vault B on Coyote number eight, the intake line for the recirculation pump on Lake number eight on Coyote Run is leaking inside the vault, causing the sump pump to come on daily to evacuate the water from the vault. This needs to be repaired before it causes some major damage to the equipment in the vault. And then the Boulder Creek uh, Pavilion Foundation leak and carpet replacement. When it rains, the pavilion at the Boulder Creek Golf Course leaks and the carpet gets wet 
and they have to call in carpet companies to suck up the water. And it normally happens right before our event, the Mayor's State of the City. We've had a number of events where we were scrambling to, uh, to get these, uh, the wet carpet uh, dried up. Installation and extension of a metal exterior covering is needed to prevent leaking on the east side of the building uh, to prevent flooding uh, of the carpet. And the existing concrete slabs were also, will also need to be replaced and constructed so water drains away from the facility, the current ones drain in. So if we get water on the concrete slabs, it kicks it into uh, the building. After the work is completed, the carpet in the pavilion will need to be replaced. On the Boulder City Golf Course, uh, the existing green mowers at the municipal course, uh, course are old. They're probably um, way past their life expectancy. These mowers are used seven days a week. We put one mower out on the front nine and one, one on, the, on the back nine every day, seven days a week. Uh, and they cut our most valuable commodity, our greens on a golf course, which um, are very expensive to maintain. So two new, new mowers and two extra sets of reels are needed. The existing mowers uh, can then be, um, the, the levels raised up, repurposed, and used as tea mowers until they die. Uh, that's a common practice on the golf courses. You want your best equipment mowing your greens, which um, is the, probably the most important part on your golf course. Also, uh, the sand pro, in order to rake uh, and smooth out the, the bunkers, the fairway bunkers and sand traps on the course, a uh, sand pro is needed. And this is a mechanical device where um, a maintenance worker sits inside and uh, it has a rake and, and it, it uh, keeps the, the sand nice and fluffy and it looks good. And it, uh, it, in order to properly maintain the fairway bunkers and sand traps, a new one of these is required. Utility carts, again, most of the uh, equipment at the Boulder City Golf Course is very, very old. And uh, the existing utility carts are past their life expectancy. Uh, we'd like to get three uh, new utility carts. Uh, these carts are used by the maintenance crews uh, when they weed eat the course, Any uh, they fertilize, they, they use it. It has a little bed on the back of it. It's gas-fired, uh, gas and it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, very good addition to the golf course. On the Muni Clubhouse renovation design, uh, the existing municipal golf course clubhouse is old and needs to be renovated. Renovation of the clubhouse will include the construction of additional space for the kitchen. If you go in there right now, the kitchen is very small. Uh, we can't have uh, events in there that uh, require catering or uh, because it, it's just too small. We'd like to make the kitchen a little bit bigger and increase this pro shop. Again, we get uh, uh, a percentage of the pro shop sales you know, at the golf course, so that this would be a good investment for the city. It would also include the renovation of the men's and women's bathrooms, the office, the bar, and the sitting areas. And golf course surcharge funds can be used for this uh, type of uh, golf course improvement. So that is the end of my uh, um, presentation. Any questions regarding that? I think we'll go ahead and complete the uh, presentations. Okay, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Shea of the Police Department. <laughs> Mayor and Council Members, uh, <clears throat> Steve Walton, Interim Fire Chief for six work days. So um, I haven't had much time. We're, we're assuming you know everything then. By <laughs> I believe that was supposed to occur on the fifth day. So. Okay. I missed that meeting. Um, so I haven't had a chance to prepare detailed comments for um, what the capital improvement project is for the fire fire uh, department, but uh, I think I can do an okay job impromptu in explaining the purpose of why the uh, auto extrication equipment, cardiac monitors, and uh, off-road emergency response equipment is, is on here. And again, I'd have to get more details, I think, to probably satisfy all the questions that may be asked, but if you'll bear with me, Um, auto extrication equipment is, uh, as stated, it's used, it's, it's forcible entry equipment to uh, enter into automobiles in the event of, of accidents that the occupants can't extricate themselves. Uh, it's also used on unusual types of events. People have 
uh, are they're trapped by different types of machinery or we've had people that you know children tend to love to put their heads between um, fences that are made out of wrought iron and, and oftentimes it's it's required to use that type of equipment so in time the right now they're they're oil and, and gas hydraulic uh, operated um, and, and they require maintenance and in time the maintenance cost outweighs the value of the old equipment and repair is no longer really the the viable fiscal option but replacement also the technology changes as as vehicles change technology with the hardened steel and the, the changes in their structure we need to manufacture uh, extrication equipment that can respond to that and actually cut or open those types of vehicles they're also made much lighter now they're battery powered and they have more uh, pounds per square inch force with the new technology so they're safer for the firefighters to operate they're not an ignition source for potential fuel on accident scenes and um, and it's it's more effective in actually accomplishing the job so that's uh, why we would have auto extrication equipment on there. I can't say what the age is, what our current equipment is, but that's a typical reason why we would look to replacement of, of that type of equipment. Cardiac monitors, uh, those are software <clears throat> as well as hardware driven. And so the software continuously, continuously needs upgrades. Again, uh, when we look at software updates, at, at some point we need newer, more uh, more uh, modern software, as well as these equipment are, they're used in a variety of, of, uh, of situations that are less than ideal for, for durability. It could be out in the desert, it could be on the side of the road, in somebody's home, and they, they wear out. And uh, it's, it's a standard practice to rotate these cardiac monitors uh, on, a, on a replacement schedule. Uh, again, I can't tell you the age of the monitors we have now, but that's why they're on a replacement schedule. And um, the off-road emergency response equipment is so that we can access people that are having accidents out in the desert. Police have a, a great um, access facility or vehicle for accessing the people, but as they need EMS care, uh, we don't have that same type of access and so it's it's not good to transport people that might have spinal injuries or severe trauma in the back of a truck or in a jeep so uh, we're looking for a vehicle that has specific equipment to be able to care for these patients uh, in those conditions and get them safely to an ambulance where they can then be transported so that's why we would be seeking uh, off-road emergency response equipment and I think that's about all I can uh, summarize with at this point without those other specific details. And that concludes my portion. Thank you. Mayor, Council, hello, I'm Tim Shea, the uh, police chief. And we have three items here that are carryovers uh, from the paperwork we submitted last year. The first is the emergency command vehicle improvements. Back in 2006, it appears, the federal government was spending a lot of money through the Urban Area Security Initiative, UWASI. And agencies throughout the nation received millions of dollars in equipment and gear, and Boulder City was one of the recipients, as was, of course, everybody else in this region. They received this uh, command vehicle that's based on a fire chassis. I think the vehicle was about 300 and some odd thousand dollars that the federal government turned over. Once they turned the vehicles over, they they don't maintain them, they don't upgrade them, they do anything. Well, the radio equipment inside this communications vehicle is from 2006, and it no longer functions with all the upgraded radios that have, in fact, it's two upgrades behind what's been done through SNAC. So this money upgrades that communications vehicle so that the radios and computer systems now work in our system. It is the only backup system that we have in the city should we have to, our dispatchers have to leave our building. So when a fire alarm goes off or something, right now what the dispatchers do is they take a portable radio 
and they try to handle communications for fire and police over a portable radio until they can get a car started and bring a car over and an officer brings it and sets up a laptop in the car so they can communicate. That's the only way they communicate and there are no phones. This has phones, it has radios and computers and that's what it's for. It can be parked anywhere, it's self-contained, um, it can be used, we, we bring it out at events but we don't use the radio systems, we use it for other things that upgrades this. And it's also important to note that this ties into number two. When, as, and um, it's kind of ironic that this is 9-11. So when 9-11 occurred in the country, there was um, massive communications breakdowns between all the emergency services that in New York and in Washington, D.C. So the federal government came around and said, okay, we got to get our communications under control here. And the federal government mandated a series of changes that happened to communications for all emergency services nationwide. It started about 2005 or six and it's still ongoing. Our supervisor's vehicles cannot be used as command vehicles. Fire departments are usually quite a bit ahead of the police. This money allows us to put radio systems in the back end of the SUVs that the supervisors use. So when they get on scenes and we have incident command going, they can flip open the back, put all the things that we need to do, and they can communicate through the vehicle. And this upgrades seven vehicles to being able to do ICS stuff. The third thing is that uh, the city has, you can see them occasionally, you'll see cameras around the city, um, around City Hall, you'll see some around. Those were installed many years ago. They don't work. They're not hooked up to anything. So the cameras that we have, um, such as these, these are not security cameras. They're not designed for that kind of function. So the city manager, um, wanted us to start looking at what needed to be done, reasonably done under security. We formed a security committee through the departments. And one of the things we're looking at is enhancing and putting in cameras where they need to be on such as doors and buildings and things like this into a system that's integrated. We have some cameras around the city, such as the airport and the parks, but none of it's integrated. None of it is monitored. There is no one to look at them. Um, there are some feeds that go into dispatch on a little screen, but the dispatchers really aren't watching it. That's not what dispatchers do. They aren't looking at cameras. So this does that. It starts the process for us to, um, what we started this year, and upgrading our camera systems and it really also is designed, it needs to have a little slash there. Our electronic lock system is old and the panels are starting to fail. And we're gonna take that from city, uh, from Public Works and we're gonna start being responsible for upgrading all those systems so the, um, your key cards work and go to some security that we need to have in some of our doors, which are like dual authentication. So not only do you have to have a key card, but you may have to have a code for certain doors, depending on where they are and, and what they're doing. And that's what the, these funds are for. It's for all of that rolled into one, one ball of wax, based upon what the security committee believes we should do next. It's then approved by the city manager. And that's it. If, uh, if you guys recall what we were talking about last night at the council meeting, uh, there was a bill introduction for the vehicle equipment replacement fund. This would be your pink handout that you have up there. Um, every year there's vehicles that need to be replaced throughout the city. Um, we created a, a, a committee within the city to um, assess the vehicles that we currently have. Um, we have a fancy math formula that takes into account the use of the vehicle, the age, what equipment's installed on it, and that helps us generate uh, a list of what vehicles come to the top of the list that need to be replaced. You'll see in this uh, pink packet that there's uh, four or five vehicles that have the recycle symbol beside them. Those are the ones that came to the top of the list for this upcoming year. Um, so you'll see on the slide, I just have uh, the two items listed there, um, utilities and then the police, but more detail is provided in, in this pink packet. We have, uh, uh, oh, six of them, sorry. There's a building maintenance vehicle, an electrical vehicle, um, a rescue vehicle for fire, a landscape mower, 
um, Parks and Rec's vehicle and uh, replacing a, a 99 Ford one-ton van for PD. Uh, you'll get some more detail on this VERF fund when it's uh, brought back to council in a couple weeks, but this is the vehicles that we are requesting for this year. Um, you'll also see at the back of the executive summary, the yellow document, we have more details on um, the different uh, the different vehicles, the VERF 101, 102, through all the way down to 5. Um, so that'll show the funding for those and anticipated funding that's coming up over in the future years. Next one is uh, information technology, which the mayor probably knows a heck of a lot more than I do on these. Um, Bryce might be able to share a little bit more information on them, but uh, we had an analysis done um, and these were the, the three items that were recommended from VC3 that we need to implement or start replacing. Um, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Bryce, but for the Migration to Office 365, we're actually going to try to see if we have some available funding or leftover funding from this year, see if we can roll over to that a lot sooner than wait until next year. Um, I know it's it will improve some of our security issues and uh, usability of it. You want to add anything to this, Bryce? Uh, yeah, I could add that uh, whatever I say will be corrected by Ben. So, <laughs> but uh, so it's kind of a domino effect actually on some of these items, and and the migration to 365 will address some of our storage issues. And you can see the storage issue is the big number here. If we were to replace our SAN as it is today, that's where the 90 comes from. But once we, so we have a <clears throat> few balls in the air, we need to reduce our data right now uh, of unneeded data, get that down, and then our migration where a lot of that will go to the cloud, which also will reduce our need for storage. So we fully anticipate that that, that SAN, that's a storage area network will be much less than where it's at right now, but that number is in there because that's if we had to replace it right now, that would be our dollar amount. But we believe that we'll work our way to, to bringing that, that dollar amount down by bringing our storage needs down and going to the cloud on a good number of things. Is that right, Ben? Uh, yeah, that's mostly correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if we come back to the slides, um, what was stated during public comment, there, were, there was some partial truth to uh, being a wish list. In uh, past years, we've typically used about two and a half million dollars for out of the general fund for uh, the general fund CIP projects. This list in the entirety is just over five million. So we were, before we started just pulling projects out, we wanted to get some feedback um, knowing that this was essentially somewhat of a wish list. Some of these are, they've, they've got to happen. Some of them we might be able to push out, um, but that's where we wanted some feedback. And so that's where that $5 million item comes from. Um, continuing on is Mr. Porter, your utilities director. Thank you, Mayor Council. Um, so I'll start with the electric for uh, fiscal year 21. Uh, you'll see at the top, which is the, the most significant project we have uh, in the capital plan, which is the BC tap to uh, Buchanan overhead line. Um, that project is currently out for bid right now. Um, that replaces all the 69 kV and other distribution from the BC tap all the way down Adams to Buchanan. Um, it doesn't take much actually to see uh, how um, dilapidated that uh, those poles and that system is just by driving down there. But um, that project has uh, been in the capital plan for some time. It is out for bid right now. We anticipate um, uh, the second phase uh, in fiscal year 21 and we anticipate that to be about uh, five million dollars total combined it's a, I don't remember the exact number but it's about nine million uh, between FY20 and FY21 oops 
sorry about that. Uh, again, the second project you see there is a continuation of uh, ongoing projects which have to do with converting the, the older antiquated 4KV distribution system and upgrading it to the 12KV system. That's ongoing as well. Um, this will fund another uh, portion up to 1.2 million uh, to continue with that conversion. Um, that's all part of um, an electrical master plan that's now been going on for a few years. Um, the San Felipe to Mendota feeder project for $500,000 is to install an underground feeder along San Felipe and Mendota Drive from Adams to George Avenue. That feeder will tie the existing lateral in various locations um, in, in an effort to actually provide a, a redundancy and reliability to all those homes in that area. Currently, it only ties to one substation. It will also bring redundancy uh, from substation three and substation five. Uh, the circuit 456162 tie uh, is a little over a million dollars. That project consists of conduit and cable installation uh, to tie three circuits uh, from substation four, which is circuit 45, and substation six together. And again, that will uh, provide more redundancy. It provides more switching and load capacity of uh, capabilities as well as replacing some older infrastructure. Um, so that's uh, mostly it for uh, what we anticipate for FY21. I do want to um, reiterate what um, uh, the Public Works Director said earlier. We will be doing some studies both on electric, water, and sewer, and so some of this very well could change. On the water side, uh, you'll see there uh, commercial large uh, meter and large um, backflow uh, replacement projects. We're in the midst of, again, uh, do, studying those through condition assessments, looking at the age, looking at meter accuracy as it relates to large meters and large commercial meters, as well as uh, improvements to our backflow prevention system. Again, a portion of this will be included in the studies that we're looking at, and um, we're estimating um, $100,000 this year as we get more detail and, and lay out those priorities. Again, that could change as well. Water main replacement program is also tied to the studies. Um, I sound like a broken record, I apologize. Um, we do know areas of, of town that are older where we may have um, a history of leaks and breaks. And so as we look at the age of the pipe, the diameter of the pipe, uh, the condition of the pipe, and breakage history, then we'll further identify and prioritize these in the, in the capital plan. Um, rebuild the pressure reducing valve stations. We are fortunate in... Um, Boulder City that we do not have pump stations. All the water that is delivered to us, both raw, both potable and raw, gets delivered by the Southern Nevada Water System, SWA, um, at a very high elevation, and we basically uh, deliver water to our customers without having to pump. What that does mean, though, is that we have a fairly significant large number of pressure reducing stations where we do have risk um, with that type of equipment because we're reducing pressures in order to make it appropriate for what's being delivered to your homes. Um, so we do have uh, a current program uh, to make sure we're replacing on a regular basis programmatically uh, the parts and pieces tied to those pressure reducing valves and or replacing them in their entirety or putting new ones in various locations if need be. Copper service replacement project. Um, in every utility that I've been to, the copper service replacements, which is the connection to the main distribution of the water line, to the water meter, <laughs> there's always been a history of leaks and breaks. It's an ongoing um, problem, essentially, with aging of infrastructure that's made of different materials. 
Uh, so we're now going through where we have older neighborhoods or, or problems, identifying those and developing programs to replace those services on a geographical, uh, logical basis. Uh, the PRV on the line to the National Service Park Service, we have an agreement to provide water to um, the National Park Service, it's raw water. <laughs> it delivers water um, down the Hemingway Valley towards the lake uh, at about 400 PSI. Um, that is well beyond design criteria for a pipeline, uh, even of that material, which is iron and is desperately in need of a pressure reducing station as well. Uh, we recently went through a, um, uh, a survey with uh, the Nevada Department of Environmental Protection. They just identified a couple of small uh, projects uh, really tied to the reservoir vent, uh, more of aging. Uh, needed some improvements and that came out in that survey, so we plan on doing that replacement. Um, the recirculation pump wet well intake replacement or renovation is actually tied to parks. Uh, we would anticipate that might be a utility project that we could do ourselves, but that we would charge parks for, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think it's tied to the other um, golf course project, so. Uh, on to wastewater, sanitary sewer uh, rehabilitation. We do annually have small projects where uh, we identify um, either corrosion in manholes or corrosion in the sewer systems with different types of pipe. Um, we typically will decide to slip line those or do what we call cured in place lining of those sewer systems. Um, really this will be more, really will be tied to uh, what comes out of some of the study work that's being done so that we can use better data to identify where these need to occur. Uh, the evaluation of the Hemingway uh, Valley sewer system is really just to take a look at some capacity concerns that are uh, maybe uh, minor, but need to be looked at in that area. Uh, we may be able to actually do that effort in-house. Uh, and then the um, sewage lift station mobile emergency backup pump uh, really is tied to the lift stations themselves. We currently have a pump on a trailer uh, that's available in the, in the event of an emergency. Again, it's old itself. Um, there's some questions on whether it is reliable in itself. So we're looking at potentially um, replacing that pump trailer and or doing some other modifications to the lift stations. Uh, the landfill, this has come up before. Um, do we need to do anything with perimeter um, uh, fencing and maintenance road? This is currently being assessed as well. Um, uh, we're estimating about $300,000 for uh, FY21, but this is something we'll be working with um, uh, the Clark County Health Department um, just to see timing, the need, the necessity, and what the extent of the project actually will be. So there's more to come on that as well. And that comes up to about $10 million in uh, FY21 utility projects. I'll sound like a broken record one more time. Uh, we do have a number of studies and in-house studies that we'll be working on and working through the Utility Advisory Committee uh, to communicate more of these needs or modifications as, as we move forward into spring. So, thank you. Just to add a little bit to what Dennis was just saying about the, the studies that are coming up, um, we don't anticipate any emergencies coming out of that, um, but if there are any emergency projects that we're unaware of, we'll be making some uh, revisions to this tentative plan so we can get it into next year. Um, 
we're like I said, we don't anticipate any, and if there's nothing that comes up, then it'll just get put into future years and programmed in where where we can fit them in. Um, but there there is always that chance that there's something that we're not aware of. Um, also, wanted to take a step back. I misstated. Our finance director reminded me. This pink verf. Uh, flyer that we've put together or finance has put together. This is for the current year right now um, showing the vehicles that we're wanting to replace um, but the vehicles that we're showing in the slideshow that's for future year. Um, our purchasing manager Paul Sikora that's heading up our, our VERF committee and the department heads that are involved in that will be getting together this fall to further look into our list of vehicles for um, the following years. Do we want to go into questions on the ones that have been presented, or would you like me to finish out the some of the highlights for the the future four years? Uh, let's go ahead and finish the presentation. Okay. So looking ahead, these are the starting with the general general fund. Um, the ABC grounds renovations, we have an estimate of 500,000. We're hoping to do that in fiscal year 2022. Um, we also a part of our security committee. We um, are starting to see the need that we should be installing security cameras in the parks. Um, so that would be the project number two there. Um, if approved in next fiscal year, the design for the Muni Club Clubhouse renovation, then we have the the construction there for fiscal year 2022. Um, and like I said, RTC approached me about starting the design for phase two of the complete street project. If approved, we will move immediately into uh, construction. And the last one there you'll see is the Boulder Creek cart barn upgrade of 800,000. Um, moving ahead to fiscal year 2023, uh, we're not sure we're going to be able to do it in one phase, but phase three would be of the Complete Street project would be going from uh, Buchanan and the parkway up over the hill and down. Um, that might more turn into a couple phases because it's a large stretch, uh, multiple utilities, intersections, um, but RTC is fully supportive of us moving forward on that. So, And if all goes well, we might try to move this up. Um, while RTC has the funding, we're, we're going to be trying to utilize that. Um, but we have put that in fiscal year 2023. Um, we also want to start renovating or continue renovating the River Mountain trailheads. Um, so we put 20, 250000 in there for uh, those renovations. And then as I had stated earlier about the Community and Convention Center, um, looking at maybe trying to combine that with the Boulder Creek um, dining room, or I might have misstated. No. Yeah, we were, we were talking about trying to combine some of those renovations into uh, uh, the community center. Right now, uh, the, the bubble they have down there, there's no restroom. you got to come over to the Boulder Creek Golf Course. So we're going to look at um, some efficiencies with that. Um, and then for Veterans Park, I know Roger has mentioned before, we would like to create a new soccer field or double-wide multi-use field. Um, this is the one that could possibly be used for dog shows. And yeah, so this could be used for dog shows and other uh, sporting events. Uh, for the electrical fund, um, there's there's a number of projects we have listed here. Uh, I'm not going to read through every one of them. I don't want to put everybody to sleep, but um, as Dennis has <laughs> reiterated multiple times, these studies that we're doing are going to help give us a clearer roadmap of, of what needs to be replaced. Um, everything, not everything, a lot of the utilities are outdated. We know that they need to be replaced, but with this roadmap, it'll help give us a, a better idea of what needs to be replaced first. So we anticipate a lot of these being adjusted, moved, changed. And then for water and wastewater, um, the reservoir valve and piping improvements. I'm drawing a blank on that one right now, Dennis. 
So um, we're just looking at some improvements in there, mostly aging infrastructure and valve replacement, um, and also some recirculation in a couple of the uh, reservoirs. Um, there are some certain NDP, um, Safe Drinking Water Act requirements we have to comply with. Currently it's not an issue. Um, it could be an issue if lake levels continue to drop, so it's something we just have to pay attention to. And if we can improve some of the circulation in the reservoirs, that can help avoid uh, potential future regulatory issues. Um, and also more PR PRVs. Um, we seem to be noticing more and more issues with the older pipes, with the, the high pressure we have with gravity feeding a lot of these water lines. We need to be replacing the PRV, the pressure reducing valves, um, and installing more where we're finding high pressure zones. Um, wastewater pump station upgrades, that's uh, a multi-year project that we were looking at. Um, Georgia Avenue at Buchanan location. I don't remember what that one is either. That one again is currently under study. It's a it's a sewer line that's um, relatively close to the edge of a channel, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and so it's in there as a a, a really is in there as a kind of a placeholder. Um, I think there's probably other things that we could do that would uh, eliminate the need to actually relocate or replace the the, the pipeline itself. So, uh, but we did want to get a replacement in the capital plan until we uh, fully identified what we needed to do out there. You can do the manholes. Yeah. As with most of the other utilities, uh, our manholes are uh, degrading. Um, I was actually experienced with this quite well at my previous job. Um, there's a few different ways we can come in. They have slip liners for manholes, um, but we need to tackle or generate a plan for uh, relining all these manholes, otherwise they'll collapse, we'll start having odor issues, leaks, then getting in trouble with EPA. We don't want any of that, so we're uh, looking at st starting a, a program for that so we can, it'll be an ongoing one of slip lining or repairing those manholes. Um, Updated on hold or removed? We, uh, through discussions with the utilities director, and we realized that the the treatment plan upgrade it's it's not needed. It's not feasible. We don't we don't need to be doing that. Um, so we've just removed that from the CIP. Um, as I said earlier, uh, we're looking at an option of maybe combining a community convention center, the dining room expansion, restrooms. And then also for the, the Smith Center with the facility studies that we got going on, um, we've gotten some initial feedback from them and uh, we don't feel that it would be justified to be dumping money into it right now until we have a, a, a proper game plan of what we wanna do. So we've removed that from the CIP. And as Dennis and I have said multiple times, we have quite a few different assessments going on. Uh, the water and sewer system, power pole, substation survey, the citywide uh, facilities master plan that we're getting close to ending, and then the pavement evaluation program that we should have any day now, um, which will give us clear roadmaps for our, all of our infrastructure. And that concludes the slides, and uh, we're here for any questions. All right, thank you. Thank all the other staff members who uh, contributed their piece to this. Uh, we'll go ahead and see if any council members have questions. Would it be possible to make just a few comments before you get started? Absolutely. Okay. I just wanted to point out that you do have this glossy book, which is the um, year two. This is our second version of the uh, Capital Improvement Executive Summary. It is definitely not complete. It has a lot more pictures than it will have in the final because we'll have filler in there, um, information on current year status of current year projects and things like that. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, we did add some additional inv information including what is currently budgeted, which last year being our first one, you know, that year two we want to show what was budgeted in the current year. Uh, we also 
uh, have numbered. A lot of the projects that you saw today were in this uh, the original CIP executive summary, so we already have the detail sheets for them. Anything that's new when you're looking at this booklet will have a two when you get to the. Um, I believe it's, it starts on page 13. So any project that has an ID number beginning with two is a new project that was not in last year's. So that's just a, a, a key for you to know. If it has a one, it was in last year's, and it's year two of last year's CIP. And um, this process is starting earlier than last year, so we do not have all of the sheets ready for you to look at that detail um, what, you know why the when the pro, why the projects needed it's a ranking among the other projects although a lot of that work was done because anything number one is in last year's book but what we want to do once we get your feedback today is we'll go back and we know we can't spend the amount of money we're showing for general fund we'll have to whittle down those projects but with your your feedback will help us determine which projects will get pushed out or maybe you know you'll determine you don't want to see us do so I just wanted to add all that in there. And there's also maps included in this book, which is new, that point out where the locations are of the projects slated for next year. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Adams. All right, I'll go ahead and start. Um, just some basic questions, just things that some of the things that stuck out. Um, the vehicle replacement program, uh, you know, I, I know, I understand that a lot of these vehicles, you know, they say past their, you know, useful life or whatever. You know, I, I personally, one of my vehicles is a 2000 Dodge Ram wagon, and uh, we put that thing through the ringer. We put, you know, a ton of miles on it, um, but, and it needs some fixing from time to time, but it's still a working operating vehicle, uh, and I don't see any time soon needing to replace it to a completely new vehicle. When we're talking about replacing these vehicles, are these like absolutely necessary or is this just kind of like, hey, you know, we want, you know, we want the touch screen with the backup rear view mirror on here instead of, you know, and, and the AC to work better. Is this, you know, are these actually necessary, all of these vehicles? No, that, that's not the case on them. Um, we look at, we track all of the work orders for these vehicles. When the cost of repairing these vehicles is getting too excessive, it, it doesn't make sense to keep them. Um, when we got specialized equipment on the vehicle that that is constantly breaking down, that's when we're we're looking at. Um, and with the math formula I was telling you about, there's a line. If if the vehicle doesn't rank above or below that line, it it's not up for being replaced. As the uh, chief was just saying, their line's drawn a little bit different. Um, <laughs> they do have a line, but there's there's different criteria for them. So I understand. Massagers. So we've been uh, working on this because one of my frustrations was how do we determine here when you get rid of vehicles? So it's a kind of an ongoing project that's pretty well coming to the end. So for the police, we have about eight different areas we track that have numeric formulas attached, engine miles. Um, engine hours, which are separate, um, cost of repair, use of fuel, is it starting to cost us more money? Is it getting beat up, starting to rust out or whatever? Then we have five classes of vehicles. So an A vehicle is a patrol vehicle. It's the one that are people, they're not driving down the store to get a carton of milk. They're the ones that we're using for emergency responses. And those vehicles, when they get to the end of being an A vehicle, they sometimes transition to a D, C, or E vehicle, which means we repurpose them into another category. So because of that, a lot of our vehicles are, we have a number of vehicles from the 90s up through the early 2000s, perfectly serviceable. They can do the job they're doing now, but they're not an A vehicle. So you can't throw ours into one lump because we have all these different kinds of motorcycles completely different than a patrol car. A detective unit or my administrative unit, for example, that I drive around in, it'll last 15 years. It's not going anywhere. But the ones we really watch closely are the ones that our men and women are out every day and responding to emergency calls. If those have a catastrophic failure, sometimes at the speeds they're going, you know, well, we don't want to have a catastrophic failure. So that's how we do it. It's quite an um, in-depth formula, and, uh, but we do try to get the best use out of vehicles for as long as we can. And I can tell you that we double the amount of time we get out of our patrol vehicles over the norm. Uh, they usually last three to four years, maybe five if you're lucky. 
We are right now replacing 2011s. So we get a lot of use out of our vehicles, much more than most agencies do. Certainly where I came before, if we got three years out of one, we were lucky. All right. Well, I have you up here, Chief, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, the command the command vehicle. So just to kind of clarify what that uh, is useful for. So you were saying if, say, there was a fire or some other reason that you weren't able to be in the uh, dispatch, wasn't able to be in the police station, they could use this vehicle as a as an alternative? Yes. It's a, it's a mobile command vehicle that is designed for its communications, can control communications and control, which on your ICS class using those are absolutely critical. So when the federal government were supplying these to local agencies all around the country, the deal is, well, they, they need to be operational, they need to be able to communicate. Well, since this vehicle was bought, SNAC, who we belong to, has upgraded the radio system a couple times. We, our radios will not function in that environment, so we need to upgrade the radios. Otherwise, we got this $300,000 vehicle, it's great if you want to sit inside in the air conditioner and maybe use the uh, men's room, but for communicating, it's useless. So we need to upgrade it. And um, the same thing with the supervisor vehicles. We, we, can't, we, have, don't have, we need to have multi-band radios so we can talk to different entities. We can't. And that's what the federal government mandated when they found in 9-11 that people couldn't talk to each other. So they're trying to evacuate buildings. One group's running away, the other group's running in because they couldn't talk. That's why so many firemen and policemen were killed in the World Trade Center. Some were evacuated and some were still going in because they couldn't talk. And that's what this is all about. Chief, I, I had a couple questions since you're here as well on the vehicles and then we'll have uh, Mr. Adams continue. You had mentioned to me one time, uh, you know, there's a lot of vehicles that sit out outside the police department. Um, the usage of some of those vehicles where they're assigned to an officer. Uh, you had mentioned that the experience has been that the vehicles tend to be a little better maintained over time if one or two officers are using that vehicle all the time rather than having it on some type of rotation. Right. There have been studies done um off and on since as long as I've been in police work. And you'll find every virtually every agency has some take-home vehicles some agencies are 100% take-home vehicles. We have some take-home and some not. Like, for example, I don't take a vehicle home with me. But some, we do. If the people live here in town, we do, because we don't have a place to keep all our vehicles. Or um, some emergency response, such as canine units, where they have home cantaline, um, things like that. But the, with pool vehicles, they don't last very long. Um, Cops are pretty rough on stuff, especially when it's not their stuff. And when you drive a pool car, you quickly learn which one's not to drive and which one's to drive. And if Bob uses a vehicle, you stay away from Bob's vehicle. Uh, pool cars last maybe three, three and a half years, maybe. When you sign an officer to them and make them responsible to them, they take much better care of them. They'll take them home and wax them and clean them up. When they hear a bump or a noise, they'll get it to the shop, and they last three to four times longer. So the agency I came from transitioned from pool cars to 100% take-home cars. We reduced what we called ERNR, which was our equipment repair and replacement costs, substantially. And uh, you'll see a lot of major agencies have done that, both sheriff's offices and police departments. So some of the vehicles you see sitting there are also breakdown vehicles in case you know, we have vehicles break, or we have some that have been transitioned into other jobs or occasional use vehicles, and maybe they tow the off-road vehicle behind it with a trailer hitch. And these are cars that would have been auctioned off, but we occasionally use them, so they're cost-effective. They don't cost us any repair money, and we don't need to buy a new vehicle, and this thing will last for eight or nine more years doing these secondary job assignments. The volunteers, you know, they transition. You'll see the volunteers on the side. They'll be able to drive these things for years. You know, the Crown Vic has been made for 10 years, something like that. We're still using them, nine years. So, Thank you. Again, it's a question that I get from residents is we seem to have a lot of police vehicles out there, but as you say, they're, uh, they're not all used for patrol. They're used for different purposes. And, right. and anybody who's on vacation or going to be at leave for more than so many days, if they do keep it at home, they must park it here. So some of those vehicles are also people on vacation or a, a week or two long, week-long training classes. We don't let them keep them at the house when they're gone. Okay. And just uh, one last question about that command vehicle. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you mentioned that it was uh, funded by the federal government uh, after 9-11. Uh, there was an awful lot of federal dollars that came out to communities. 
I know I happened to be living in Oklahoma at that time, and uh, that city was given, uh, it was over a million dollars for these rapid response vehicles. Um, you know, it's understandable why that happened as a result of the 9-11 tragedy. The problem we get into and the problem we see with a lot of things is the federal government will buy it for you and then it's your problem after that. Right. And but the communications uh, part of it is absolutely essential. So we don't you know, we don't rapid response vehicles, armored vehicles, you know, those things just aren't necessary. I had several of those that are, to be honest truth, they're a pain in the neck. Yeah. Um, but the communication vehicle for us is essential because we have no backup dispatching center. We have no secondary place to go there. If our if our center goes down, which means we have a fire alarm, they're supposed to leave. The only thing we can do is if we can do it quick enough is transition everything over to Metro and then Metro has to take our phone calls, reroute them somehow to us and our dispatchers are dispatching over a portable radio. So, um, and, and I do understand that, you know, we, there's been talk of, uh, you know, there is another dispatch center here in Boulder City. Uh, that's used by the federal government. Uh, so there's been talk about that. Um, and I guess what I'm getting at is, do we get a point with a vehicle like that? Well, let me ask you this. Has it ever been used in response to an emergency? Since I've been here, no. I don't know since 2000, I think they got it in 2006, I really don't know. But we've used it at events and we you know, brought it out and used it and ran drills with it to see if we could make it work if something like this happens. So I use it um, to get our folks used to using it, to get the dispatchers used to using it. And uh, so if we ever do need it, it's like, oh my gosh, how do we run this thing? Um, so for large events such as fireworks, things like that down at Veterans Park, it helps us out. It gives us a mobile command center. Fire and us work out of there. I put a dispatcher in there to try to run all that stuff separate from the police department, separate all those operations. Um, the, the park service has asked several times if we could bring it and do joint operations with them when they have very large events down there because they don't have anything available in this area. So, um, you know, we use it, but, you know, we just, it's like anything else. It's like a, almost like a fire truck, you know, it sits in the station unless there's a fire. Yeah. And you don't, if it's not there and there's a fire, what are you going to do? Well, again, you know, and I, this is certainly not just an issue with Boulder City. Because right. of that federal program, um, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars went out. And in looking back, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Uh, but in looking back at what those vehicles, what those resources did, um, I, I, I don't know that the federal government can say that was the best program that they ever came up with. But I think Boulder City, from again my short time being here, was very um, conservative in what they asked for and what they took. And I don't know from the fire side, but I know from the police side, I've looked to see if there's things I consider waste because I was involved in the dispersion of a lot of that equipment since. 2006. So uh, Boulder City didn't do that and the command vehicle they have was designed to be integrated with everybody else so we could all work together like the federal government was mandating. It came out of a presidential order that had to be put into place and acted upon um, by 2009 and it made us, many of us, have to change our entire radio systems. So it's still ongoing, it's not completely finished yet, but uh, we just need to upgrade ours so it can do what it's supposed to do for the reason it was given to us. Yeah, and I, I fully support that integration of the radio systems. I mean, obviously that's critical in any emergency. It, it's how best do we achieve that, I guess. And, and yes, you know, the government gave, the federal government gave us that vehicle. Uh, that's one platform, but you know, is it the best platform? Is it the only platform? Is it the platform we want to look at going forward? Uh, I, I think those are all questions, but yes, we have it, so it's being put to some use. Yeah, and it's going to last for many, many, many years. We, it gets regular maintenance, of course. It's basically a fire truck chassis and a fire truck body and everything made into a command vehicle. It's one of those great big uh, things made by Pierce, those things are made by Pierce, and they last forever. It's, it's not going to wear shops. People take very good care of it. All right. So. Mr. Adams, I'll turn it back to you. Sorry. I do that a lot. <laughs>
Okay. Um, you mentioned down at the cemetery the landscaping. Uh, do you know which plant material exactly you're planning or looking to consider removing and what plant material you might be replacing that with? I don't know the details of it. Uh, our landscaping supervisor is the one that had assessed the, everything down there. Um, he did mention to me that some of the trees weren't fitting of our climate. Um, that's what he wanted to replace there. Um, and then the irrigation system being outdated. Um, I, I, I would just add one thing that uh, I saw a news story yesterday about how everybody in Boulder City absolutely loves the palm trees that are going to be planted out on the uh, Great. parkway. That's good to hear. And I thought, hmm, I live in Boulder City and I hate those palm trees. But. <laughs> so when, we're, when we're looking at what's appropriate, mm, okay, let's, let's see who gets to decide that. Noted. I'm not a big fan of palm trees either. <laughs> I've been, hear, I've been hearing that a lot lately. I, I think you may have a palm tree hate club up here. Uh -huh. <laughs> I literally saw a rat climbing up one the other day, so please do not add them to our city. I'll make a note right now. Thank you. <laughs> All right, good to know I'm not alone up here. Um, <laughs> On the, the Railroad Museum, uh, as far as funding goes for the, for the Railroad Museum and what we're, we're kind of, uh, is that all 100% that's, that's happening right now? Is there, I mean, where is that at in the thing? And, you know, so when we're talking about what we're going to be doing, uh, you know, are we going to be working on something that, oh, turns out uh, this Railroad Museum is not going to happen after all? The, we actually just took a, a, a trip with them last week. Last week, the week before, last week, and uh, they were talking about the different funding mechanisms, how they're trying to move forward. Um, they're sounds like they might be doing some door to door, trying to uh, drum up more money. But they they have a number of grants that they're trying to get. Um, I completely understand. Yeah, if we build a road out there and then nothing happens. Who's going to look like the dummies? If I can expand on that response. So the legislature just passed authorization uh, bill for $200 million um, uh, for grant monies uh, under their parks and cultures. Uh, and there's a specific section that deals with $30 million for museums and the like. And specifically in that section, Boulder City is mentioned, the Boulder City Railroad Museum. And on the record was added that uh, up to, I'm trying to remember if it was 25 or $27 million of the 30 million could be allocated towards the Railroad Museum in Boulder City. The big important first step in uh, the process is to get authorization. So the authorization is there. The next step would be at what point do you, um, or the appropriate, uh, what point do we actually appropriate that money to where now the money is actually available? Um, it doesn't look like it will be available in the next two years, but potentially after that, it's likely that some of that funding will be available. This particular road, whether or not uh, the museum comes to fruition, does allow for uh, flow of traffic in and out of those particular businesses from the front side of their lot to the back side, if you will. Uh, it's an, uh, a road that can be utilized uh, by those that are going to uh, you know, transact their business um, along that area from the um, uh, the individual on the corner all the way down um, you know, to Yucca Street. So there's a number of access points and there's actually three specifically that are being identified that would tie into the access road and then have access from the, the back uh, lane to Boulder City Parkway. And so do we feel then that that would be the best, regardless of whether the railroad museum, that, that would exactly, be the best that, use of that portion of land? Right. And keeping in mind that one, of the in, that one of the good things by this project moving forward and being funded by yet another agency is that it puts additional uh, pressures, if you will, publicly on the state to ensure that those dollars do get, in fact, allocated towards that particular project. And as I recall, some of the, the laterals, I'm not sure what term you want to apply, uh, that would go from the parkway to that road, um, at least one, maybe two of those could be very disruptive to existing businesses. 
Uh, have the businesses been interviewed and uh, informed of exactly what that's going to do? The, these other roads that have been in existence forever as far as rights of way are concerned have pretty much been consumed by businesses for running their businesses on city property. Those roads were converted in essence by the property or by the business owners as parking lots um, is what they turned out to be. But uh, when you look at some of those access points, and again, I haven't looked at you know definitive plans. It hasn't gotten to that point. But you know, in terms of the width of what's available, that still will allow for parking but also allow for traffic to get from the uh, access road out to uh, Boulder City Parkway. So that would be obviously something that would be looked at by uh, RTC and l taking a look at designing and making sure that all that is still available and it, doesn't, it has minimal impact, if no impact, uh, to those businesses. Well, I, I, you know, I know it's been talked about for a couple of years at least, and. Uh, you know, I always hear, well, you know, the businesses are aware of it, and then you go talk to the business, and they're like, I never heard that before. So just want to make sure that before the bulldozers show up, everybody's informed. Yep. Um, the community slash convention center, I know we were talking about, uh, you know, maybe including that with Boulder Creek uh, redesigns and stuff like that. Um, but I notice a lot of things kind of are slated, like, you know, we're waiting for the, you know, you, facility studies to kind of come back in. Um, are we not considering that because it, it just wasn't notated? Are we also considering for that potential use with this facility study? So the facility studies is looking at existing facilities, um, but uh, the previous city council um, through um, you know policy that they uh, enacted did want the staff to look at a potential uh, for the city to have a if you will, meeting place, convention center, that sort of thing. Uh, as we were looking at other facilities, it just seemed logical to uh, bring together certain types of facilities uh, in and around the Boulder Creek Golf Course. So in essence, if you took uh, the current bubble uh, and convert that to a community center, add additional restrooms, which we needed to do there anyway, because we have events there in that bubble. And uh, you heard, you know, where people have to, you know, we have to open up the golf course at night in order to be able to use the restroom facilities and the like. Um, so this is an attempt to take a look at uh, potentially multi-use uh, at uh, the location of the golf course itself. Um, so we're uh, not only improving those facilities for during the day, you know, for those activities, but then later on it's also available in the evening for either, um, you know, events here locally that could be hosted uh, in that area or, you know, out, uh, you know, smaller groups that might want to be looking for, you know, meeting venues and whatnot, you know, day-long events that potentially that could be made available for them as well. And I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to having that location. You know, obviously, you know, when I think community, you know, spaces, I, I often think, you know, downtown now I know it's a, it's already a little bit congested. I, there's not a lot right. of space available, but, you know, that is something that I, that I think of um, when I think of, you know, access and stuff like that. It is a little bit out there. It's not too right. difficult for people to get to, but it's something that, that I certainly uh, would like to consider. All right, Mr. Hall, I got a, <laughs> this might be a little bit more uh, wishful thinking, but you know, you're talking about the filtration system, uh, getting a new one of those. Is there anything, when we're talking about getting new parts for the, for the existing pool, is there anything that we're purchasing now that could potentially be used uh, with, the, with the new facility? Is, there, is that even a possibility, or is that just because of the system we have and what we have to build towards not possible? The, the existing codes for 2020 are quite a bit different from 1980 when we built, we built the pool. And the health department has um, required certain things. Um, you have to have three filters, three heaters, three uh, chlorinators, a uh, bigger mechanical room, you know, that type of thing. You have to separate the chemicals from the, the room. The stuff that we're buying right now, the filter system, would be compatible with that system that we have down there right now. 
um, I want to make sure that we, we can operate the, the pool and not have to shut down every couple of days because the filter grids are popping off and people can't swim. People get really mad when they when you cancel their kids' swim classes and they have to go to Henderson to swim. We have people that swim seven days a week there. And when you when you um, go after their schedule and, and uh, close the pool for a couple of days, they get really mad. So that, in my opinion, that, that is a very important thing. Now, if we build a new pool, um, I'd like to get away from the open uh, filtration system and go to a high-rate sand filtration system that you can backwash without having to shut down for four or five hours. It saves a lot of man hours, a lot of chemicals, a lot of, um, a lot of work. Um, the, uh, and they've really come out with some good stuff here in 2020. So to answer your question, um, the stuff that we're buying right now is to stay open right now. We do have three, uh, three pumps. We have two in operation, one as a backup. If one goes out, we take it out, put the one that uh, we have in, take the other one, get it repaired, and we, we start all over again. So the majority of stuff that we're purchasing is for the existing system. Right, I, I understand, and, and I think that's incredibly important to, to keep it operating. It's, it's a difficult uh, task, I understand. So I'm, I'm just curious if does some thought does go into it. I also realize that it's not really possible without even knowing what we're could potentially could be getting into, but just something, uh, I was just curious if it's even possible to consider. So yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Another thing, uh, the utility carts uh, past the useful life. Is this? Are we talking the same thing about like, where we were talking about with the vehicles, where these these things need to absolutely get replaced, or I mean, are they still running and operating and can do what they need to do? Or they're barely running. The seats are all ripped off. The um, they they're hard to start. The brakes are going. I mean, these things have been in operation probably ten years. I think the life expectancy on a cart like that is um, probably three to five years, depending on the workload. Um, and they're used every day by the golf course maintenance workers as they weed eat and they work on the bunkers, they pick up stuff, they do irrigation uh, repair, um, and it's just, you know, just time to replace them. And so we believe that replacing is going to be more useful of our money than repairing and reupholstering and getting new brakes and stuff like that for these? Yeah, engine life uh, on, on these things, they have a um, X amount of time for engine life and they've approached and there, there's a, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'm doing a park master plan right now where we go into golf course equipment and their life expectancy. Well, you know, what does a green mower, uh, you know, how many hours do, do a green mower, does a green mower work and when, when can we expect to re replace it? So that'll be what we're going to be covering in some of the park master plans and equipment master plan that we are that we're currently doing but yeah the certain hours um, once you get to certain hours if the engine blows then and and the infrastructure the uh, chassis is is destroyed um, then it's better to buy new than to try to replace all right thank you mm -hmm. I have no other questions or comments at this time okay. oh. councilwoman bridges Sure. Uh, I'm not sure what questions I have yet because it's a lot to digest. All right. First of all, I want to make sure that I was clear that on the everything under streets is reimbursed by RTC. Correct. Okay. So it's not included in that uh, amount at the end of the pages. No. The the five million, million. is general fund, and then there's an additional four point four million that you'll see under streets. That's RTC. Oh, yep. in the streets. Yep. Um. Okay, and what is it that we can't use anymore? I was going to write that down because I found that interesting. On the HVAC? Oh, the R22. It's the yeah. refrigerant that you it's put. It's like Freon. Yeah, you put that in the system. Um, and I believe it's January of 2020, so here in four months, three months, they're not allowing you to sell or produce that in the United States. So we have to use HCFCs instead of CFCs, right? <laughs> yeah, that's why we're trying to replace those remaining 46 units to upgrade to what is acceptable. Okay, and the Community Convention Center, that is just that half a million is just set aside for design work? That yes. That's projecting mm -hmm. for design work. And... Um, I, I think, 
also, yeah, clubhouse entrance, please, no. No, uh, um, we could have cactuses. Cactuses do very well in this climate. Um, I think I'm going to, um, oh, I know. I was very interested in the issue of the vid video security. So we don't have CCTV everywhere, right? Or do we have any? Chief Shea is going to be able to answer these. OK. We, uh, we have some operating camera systems that the parks has, but they're just for them. They're there. It doesn't go anywhere. We have some in the court that um, are for the court system. And there's very special rules and regulations when it comes to court and what you can re do in there. And then we have some at the airport. And uh, the other cameras you see around this area, like on the poles and things, none of those work. I have no idea how long they've been inoperative. I don't even know when they were installed. So um, what we're finding when things happen, we'll say, hey, do we have a video on that? Like most places do, and we, we don't. So we had an incident that happened. Someone was left on the, like the front doors of City Hall one day, and they said, well, we'll look at the video. Well, there's no video. Um, there's no video, like, anywhere. So most of this would be just recorded versus having somebody sitting and looking at 12 screens in. Right. We would, well, we want to evaluate all of the processes of the security committee. And is there a need, is it reasonable to have a, like a civilian um, contractor like a private security monitor cameras or not for us? Does that really make sense in our environment or does it not? And. Uh, that's part of things that they'll look at and help evaluate. My 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 gut feeling is no, no, that we should have recording systems, and then when we need things, we'll go back. So it won't be um, proactive, like responsive, like some places where you're something you're watching things real time, and you would dispatch patrol cars, but you can see something going on. This would be after the fact, unless the city gets to the point where they want to have some of those monitored that way. Okay. Mr. Mayor, um, we do have cameras, active cameras that we monitor at the Parks and Rec Department at uh, Veterans Memorial Park. We have them at Hemingway Park, and we also have them at the swimming pool. And these are, these are monitors that we are actively uh, looking at at those facilities. Okay, and by actively looking at, you mean? They, when you're working on your computer, you can have a little, um, you pull up a code and those three cameras will pop up on your computer where you can actually see in living time what's going on at those facilities. And we've, we've been able to uh, capture some uh, vandalism and, and prevent some vandalism because we saw some, some kids doing things that they were, were able to contact the police or go down there and take care of it ourselves. So it, do, it does work. Okay. I, I'm just concerned that Parks and Rec, you know, we have an efficient police department, but... Well, we, we are working with Chief Shea and, and trying to uh, get our systems together there. Okay. Yeah. Councilwoman Bridges? Uh, let's see. So things like the wastewater, sanitary sewer, rehab, evaluate Hemingway, that, that's all under study right now? It is. Yep. We, uh, some of them you'll see under the water and the wastewater, um, for lack of better terms, are, are placeholders. We know that there's repairs that we got to do on a yearly main, on a yearly basis. So like the first one on the wastewater, sanitary sewer rehabilitation, we're not calling out on Arizona Street. We're, we're putting that $100,000 in there because we know that there's going to be stuff that we need to replace. We just don't know exactly what street it's on or w where it's at located in town. And then that's what uh, the studies that uh, the utilities director is, has underway. Okay, I do have a question, and I didn't know whether this was an appropriate time to bring up the letter. Okay, yeah, I just, um, I, I was gonna bring it up last night, and I thought this might even be a better time to bring up the letter, because this way we can put this thing to bed, that we did receive a letter from Con Ed. Uh, and what it says is we have completed any and all responsibility and commitment to the redundant water line that was built in the last year and, year and a half. We're done. There is no, any, there is nothing else we are required to do. Correct? Is that Dave? That is correct. Once the um, work was almost completed, um, staff reached out to the company to ask them 
that is, you know, or to have them verify that it's the city's understanding that with the completion of that particular portion of the water line and with the exhaustion of the funds that were provided, that uh, that completed our obligations under the contract as we interpreted it. And they obviously then sent a letter back um, saying that they in fact agreed that yes, it does, does have, complete all the contractual obligations of the city and so there's no further obligations uh, moving forward. Right. Great. Now, if, obviously, if they do want uh, the line extended, then that becomes now a new agreement that we would have to craft if they want the city to do it versus if they want to put it in. Um, you know, that would be a whole new agreement that we would have to enter into. Right. And that, from what I understand right now, Axiona is the one, only one that had needed water. That's correct. And they don't have that anymore. Great. Thank you. I, I would just like to mention, too, then, that... Um, no solar facility of any type in El Dorado Valley at this point would ever receive any benefit whatsoever from the construction that was just completed on that water line. At this point, given where the water line terminated, that is a correct statement. Right, so a drop of water is never going to reach where um, the projection, the original contract, matter of fact, we're miles away from where uh, that was supposed to provide any benefit until such time that that water line is taken all the way down to the solar fields, uh, they would not have access, uh, any ability to access that, that redundant water line. So we've got a two point something million dollar uh, hole that bores through the desert and stops somewhere. That is correct. Thank you. I have just a uh Another question, as far as, so ownership and maintenance of this water line, uh, is it us, is it still our water line, is it their water line? No, the water line belongs to the city. Um, they had to pay for the uh, installation of the infrastructure and uh, the agreement is, is once the infrastructure was put in, then it becomes city property to maintain. Okay, and... I uh, I think I don't have any more questions right now. I'll let you know if I do. Thank you. Councilwoman Folder. I get the easy part because everyone answered most of my questions already. <laughs> that makes it easier on me too. Yeah. Well, you have it easy because RTC pays for all the street stuff. Uh huh. So that skips that. But I just want to ask you: Is there? Do we have? Do we have anyone in house that can design buildings? Can design land? Um, design uh, landscaping? Um, not buildings. Um, we do have one engineering tech slash inspector that is extremely useful at AutoCAD. Um, he does a lot of our uh, conduit projects, roadway projects. Um, he's pretty loaded up right now and we're going to keep him that way. He, he enjoys doing it and he does a great job. Mm -hmm. um, we have others on staff that know their way around CAD fairly decent. Um, but f as far as buildings go, I, I wouldn't classify any of our staff being able to design buildings. Okay. Um, so just kind of, you know, with landscape and design, it's pretty, unless you're hitting a lot of other utilities, you know, if we could bring a lot of that stuff in-house and save some monies. Um, just <clears throat> with this, I, you know, I would like to see the five million come down um, and, you know, put a priority to, um, you know, projects that are required by law first, and then mm -hmm. second, things that will directly help the residents. Yep. So for safety reasons, utilities, fire, police, um, we would save a lot of money if technology never changed. I see a lot, of, a lot of that is just updating our technology that we never used, really. Um, the um, future things that are going on, I just, because, it's hindsight, right? So I know that we just did a replacement of the um, bubble over at Boulder Creek, and now we're fixing the problem that that's creating from the water coming in. So, you know, hindsight, if we could have made that something that filled the need that we're now looking at changing it again with restrooms and we have to replace the way it's put up. Um, I'd like to avoid those kind of things. 
So um, like our rail, for instance, like coming up with the railroad. So they're going to share and connect the trails um, with the railroad to our current bike trails. Mm -hmm. And to look to see maybe if we could piggyback off that, if they're going to do bike trail improvements, um, to look in if they want to use ours to, you know, maybe share some of those funds. Not do it now and then come through and they go, oh, well, we're going to move it here or there over to connect it better. Yeah. Um, and same with the road that would access the linear park. Um, the, the other just thought I had was just, um, you know, it's hard to say which things we really want to move forward with. You know, when you look at, when you guys are doing the vehicle replacement fund, you have a very systematic way of doing that. And right now we have like at least three or four studies we're waiting to hear on to decide what mm -hmm. we're going to do with our buildings. What are we going to do with our, you know, what utilities need upkeep, what streets need to be um, pavement redone. Yeah. So um, I hope that we can, as those studies come out in the next few months, that we can reevaluate our priority. Definitely. And, and to add to that, um, when we said that we were looking for your feedback, it wasn't project specific. It was more of, like if we mentioned a project and all four of you were, or all five of you were just, no way, we, we can't be doing that. That's the sort of feedback I guess mm -hmm. I was I was mentioning. Um, but well, yeah, the, the palm tree was, I think, one of those. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think it's something we all I, agree on. I didn't hear that. My hearing aids were going off. <laughs> we, we can repeat it for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you could. Better I, landscaping. Yeah, I, I have it right here, and it's underlined. Well, well noted. <laughs> Not in front of other light poles and street signs. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but no, I think I think that real the the concern I think was maybe the community convention center, and looking at that a little bit more before jumping into um, design of something, mm -hmm. because I think there are some concerns of it in its location, and what use it's actually going to be good for. Are we are we what's the clientele that we're looking at using that? Whether you know. I, I feel like there's a lot of money that goes into the golf courses and we don't see a lot coming out of that. And I just want some better benefit Boulder City residents that way. Mm -hmm. um, and last, because I really just feel that when you're looking at these designs to please consider, you know, who's paying for this now. I think a lot of these utility projects were pushed off. And so a lot of the residents now are paying for something that people have enjoyed for the last 20 years. And so to really have the people who are present enjoying the projects they're paying for hmm. now. So. I think that's all I have. So, thank you. Councilman Harhay, did you have any questions? He's it's still active. It says it's connected. He probably is on mute. He needs to take it off. Well, I. I, after I yeah, after I turn my mute <laughs> off. Well, first of all, I want to apologize for Rick Tardy to the meeting. However, Sometimes hospital time does not coincide with reality, and such was the case today. The only thing that uh, I was kind of disturbed uh, in listening to the uh, report where we had video cameras presently that are unmonitored, and I think uh, Mr. Hall uh, came up uh, with uh, some solution for some of those. But I'm wondering what the efficacy of probably putting uh, the output of those cameras on a video recording device, whereby if there was vandalism, uh, that uh, area can be uh, surveyed again and be used for uh, apprehension and prosecution of those involved in uh, vandalism or whatever wrongdoing was done in that area. Councilman Harhey, uh, Roger just told me that in addition to the live feed of the, the park's video cameras, they are being recorded. Well, that's good to hear. Any other questions, Councilman Harhey? No, not at uh, this time. Okay. Um, since cameras were the last thing discussed, uh, apparently there's some security committee that gets together and discusses these things. Um, I, I don't want Boulder City to be a fishbowl, so 
I understand at some of the parks that there have been vandalism issues. Um, you know, hopefully the, the cameras have reduced that, the incidence of that. Um, but I don't think we need a camera on every street. Um, you know, uh, we, we need to balance Big Brother against crime prevention and not turn Boulder City into a big video arcade for people to look at. So I think there are uses for cameras, but uh, whatever this security committee is, I would say whatever decisions they're making need to come to council for discussion and review before implementation. Mm -hmm. A um, couple other things, since uh, a lot of the cost that's involved here is with the utilities. I know that there are these studies that are ongoing right now. That puts us in a difficult place. You know, if we sit up here and nod yes to all this stuff, and then three or four months these studies come in and the world changes, um, that kind of leaves us in a bad spot. Uh, I, I understand timing's never perfect on these things, but we're being asked to look at a lot of these projects and say yay or nay, that we agree or disagree with them, and we don't really have the information yet to do that. Uh, be that as it may, I think it was mentioned earlier, and, and actually it's a question I have here. Um, I know that both you and Mr. Porter with the Utility Department uh, have been here, I believe, less than a year. You're getting close, so, you know, we're... Nine months. Okay, <laughs> so you're getting close. Um, when you came here, did you find any programs that were in place for standardized reviews and replacement programs, evaluation programs? Um, speaking from the public works side, we did have a, a street assessment. It was a little outdated. Um, Part of the standard protocol is trying to get that updated, they recommend every five years, um, with the LiDAR technology. The technology is technolo more technology, is improving. Um, they recommend having the streets drove with this LiDAR technology every five years. So we did have a system for maintaining the streets, updating the streets. Um, it was just outdated. We, we needed a approach RTC to have them pay for a company to come out here with their specialized van with cameras strapped all over, all over it and drive every one of our streets. Um, as for the utilities? Uh, my observation uh, with regards to, and I'll start with electrical, with, with electrical, um, that master plan for replacing infrastructure and providing additional reliability and redundancy had is a little more mature. Uh, it's been ongoing for a few years now. So, you know, that's in, you know, progress further. Uh, with regards to water and sewer, uh, what it looks like is that um, those who were before me knew uh, there were uh, items that needed to be addressed programmatically with regards to um, backflow prevention programs and meter replacement programs and rehab and rehabilitation programs. So they did put placeholders in uh, in the CIP that were relatively undefined, but you know you can tell they knew they were going to have to be addressing that infrastructure, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, but again, there were also items in the CIP, and I'll mention one that wasn't shown here as one that was uh, removed because we removed it a few months ago which is the effluent pipeline that was two and a half million dollars. Well, there really was no definition for that. We took that out a few months ago. It's no longer in the five-year CIP plan. That was two or two and a half million dollars. I can't remember exactly. And so we have made those type of adjustments where we know today that there are projects that, in addition to projects, we know they're probably gonna have to be funded. There's some that just don't need to be funded or have no definition or need. Okay, uh, I, and part of that, or the second part of that question then is, um, you know, we, we always seem to be in this uh, circular thing of, well, we know stuff needed to be done, but it wasn't done, or things were budgeted over the last couple of years, but not done, so they're still in the budget, but the money wasn't spent. Um, you know, again, it, it makes it difficult to look at these capital improvement project plans see the same project listed. Uh, it was funded previously. It was, for whatever reason, it was unable to be done. 
uh, and yet new money, it appears to be new money, is being uh, budgeted for that same project that now has become two or three years old, uh, that each year has been in the budget, but the money doesn't seem to ever carry forward. It just is a new expense each year. Can I add some comments to this? Sure. Uh, I think you would just mentioned something about um, do we have any assessment plans to, you know, how do we decide what we're going to fix? Well, last year was a year of firsts. Uh, we had the first CIP executive summary. We had the first budget executive summary. And we had an employee um, draft pulling together a bunch of documents called the Strategic Asset Management Plan, which is kind of the Bible for the city. And um, it, it, it's a very good document. And she, what she did is she gathered all the information we had on, on our pipes, our hydrants, our miles, miles of roads, miles of hydra, um, number of hydrants, how we assess systems. And this was the first attempt at this. And a, when a lot of these studies occur, it, that information will be updated into this document, which will become like the Bible of the city, and we'll be able to refer to it in, in conjunction with the capital plan to say, okay, we're doing this, and how we got here was based on the information that we use systematically to assess our systems, our roads, our uh, electric lines, our water pipes, our sewer manholes. So, it, you know, this is a really good document, and I know a lot of um, improvements are going to be made to it once we get all these studies done. So I just wanted to add that in because there has not been much mention of this, and this is um, a really good document that if somebody would like me to send them a copy or Keegan could um, provide copies to the, to the council, I think it would be enlightening to see all the information we did gather last year. And, and perhaps a, a link from a web page on the city website that, you know, I, I don't know, on your finance page or somewhere, uh, to be able to link to these various documents that we've been talking about, the executive summary, the vehicle program, those types of things. So that when the public watches eagerly this video tonight, um, they'll know where they can go get that information. I'm sure they're going to watch it at least two times. I'm suspecting <laughs> they'll, they'll have a DVR. <laughs> Um, but, but I do want to point out, um, I've seen huge improvements, and that's certainly a big part of it. I think what we're doing here today, looking at these figures, um, I can recall being here seven, eight years ago and seeing a uh, capital improvement plan that was essentially a cut and paste of several different Excel spreadsheets tossed into a PDF and said, there you go. Um, so. I, my compliments to everyone on this, and I do appreciate you pointing out that document that I know is a work in progress, but doesn't get mentioned very often. Right. And Mayor, if I just may mention that uh, not only the strategic asset management plan, which actually the foundation of that document is many of these other documents, like a parks master plan that is in the draft format, um, you know, the pavement management system, some of the other uh, you know utilities uh, uh, rate study will be part of those source documents that actually feed into the the strategic asset management plan. A comment was made earlier about how do we prioritize prioritize projects across the city. There's actually, in the strategic uh, asset management plan, there is, you know, how we structure that. And if it's required by law, that is well, like one of the highest uh, ratings that you get because we have to do it by law. We don't have a choice kind of thing. Uh, but then there's others that then, based on, um, you know, where they rank, uh, that makes it, you know, less discretionary or more discretionary depending on the rating system. So those documents are available. Um, you know, if you recall last year at the very first CIP you had a very, well it's only one of you up there, uh, there was a very thick document that you received that had, you know, every single project and whatnot. You will actually be receiving that for your next meeting which will have every single project outlined, the funding sources, so forth and so on. And even though we said today that there are 
placeholders and it seems like it's a little loosey. It is intended to be loose because we want to make sure that when projects you know, are completely defined, there will be a project list. That project list will turn into a project that will be funded under the CIP and then that will come to council for approval. So you will see that you know, the dollars will match up to those project lists. Um, you know, today, for example, um, I'll look at uh, our utilities director and you know, we haven't mentioned this much and there's not a specific line item in the utilities budget for this under CIP, but you know, I still drive around and I'm wondering when is that telephone pole gonna fall on me? And there typically is a telephone replacement plan and I know that that's one of the studies that is going to be finished that will help to rate uh, you know, what poles and how often we should be replacing, um, you know, as uh, throughout the city because we don't have that in place. Now, was there a spreadsheet? I'm sure there was somewhere. What was the rationale of what got replaced what year? That's what we're missing uh, in many of these uh, plans previously. So, um, you know, whether it's the pavement plan, whether it was uh, you know, sewer, the manhole uh, cover replacement, whatnot. There were some rudimentary things that we found here and there, but it was not substantive enough that today we could give you, here's the reasons why in the past, and here's the reasons why going in the forward. Uh, you know, but we are filling that in the, you know, today and going forward by many of these plans, uh, many of these studies that will culminate into a document, a source document, uh, as we move forward. Uh, so, you know, we know what we have, you know, roads that we're going to do. We put in and allocated a specific dollar amount, but that road priority will come out of the pavement management system once we get that. What is the number one priority based on, you know, the ranking? And then that's likely, you know, absent of any other, you know, real day today, what's going on on our roadways, that may be the first item that we say, you know, we're recommending funding this based on the pavement management system. Okay, um, and again, I, I the reason I asked the question is I think there have has been that occurring. Um, the problem is I I believe it was Councilwoman Folda mentioned before. Now we're starting to get a picture of what's due. You know, one day you have to pay the piper, and it appears that that day is becoming a lot closer for Boulder City. And that's a problem because it appears that it's a pretty big bill that wasn't paid over the years in installments, if you will, uh, that we're going to look at a dollar amount that's going to be stunning here. And I think it's very important that we do get it nailed down so that we know how that can be accomplished over time. Uh, we can't fix everything that's wrong, that's been going wrong for decades in a short period of time. That you just can't put that kind of burden onto the taxpayers and say, well, folks, it's time to pay up. Uh, so that, that's part of the reason I'm asking that question is as we get this information together, uh, I think there's going to be some sticker shock on some of this stuff, and we need to be prepared to prioritize that word is going to become very important because we're not just going to be able to say, well, we've got 10 things here, we'll go ahead and do the first eight. Uh, we're going to have 100 things here, and we need to figure out which of those are going to be the first eight before we get to the next 92 on the list. So that, that's one overall point. A um, couple things on the uh, utility program. Uh, when we look at doing things like the pole replacement program, uh, there's probably something out there, but it may not fit our particular climate because we do have such a dry climate here. I think that's been fortunate for us that some of these poles that have probably been standing there for 90 years are still standing. Uh, but again, can we replace all the ones that need to be replaced at one time, or are we going to have to say, you know what, we're just going to have to keep our fingers crossed on some of these? <laughs> no, I think I think uh, when it's all said and done, when we get through the assessment process based on the data we get, um, uh, testing we do with the polls, we can come up with, I would think, a really solid program that is managed on an annual basis 
so that there's not this significant peak or, or you know two million or three million or four million dollar project to try to well no we got to fix it all at one time i think we'll have good enough data so that that's more manageable uh, we can make decisions whether it's work we do in-house or we have to contract out and i i use the word programmatic because i think that's what it'll be and um, that will avoid things like rate chalk and those types of um, activities. And frankly, we have some old poles here that are still in great shape, uh, but some aren't. Uh, our guys will do the best they can in certain uh, instances. You'll drive around, you can see where they've done some repairs. There's temporary guidelines. There's, you know, we know where all those are. So when we start doing the assessment, we can focus on those areas that we know, you know, just by their experience where we, where we need to start. Uh, but there may be other areas that are also in need that we don't know. So when we get through that assessment process, I would hope we'd have a good program laid out for that. And, and I, I think it also brings up the point, you know, some of the positions that were approved over the past two years, additional positions, uh, Mr. Luttrell made mention of it tonight with the uh, HVAC, the air conditioning replacement program, uh, I believe we hired an air conditioning technician that's able to do some of that work. You know, if we're looking at a pole program, pole replacement program uh, that needs to go on for 10 years, um, do we look at instead of uh, farming that project out as we've done with the 4KV transformers, uh, we'll hire two or three or four people and buy the truck that needs to be bought uh, and put those people to work for 10 years uh, doing that rather than outsourcing this to other companies. I think that's part of the equation we need to look at. You know, sometimes it makes sense to go outside and sometimes it makes sense to bring that work in-house. And I see that as a very strong possibility with regards to those types of programs. Okay. Um, with regard to the parks and recreation, um, I, again, I think somebody mentioned it earlier about the golf courses. When I look at the investment uh, that's being proposed in the golf courses here, and then I think uh, Mr. Hall had mentioned that these are good investments as they'll uh, you know, be good for the, the property there. Has there ever been an assessment done on the investment that the taxpayers make into the, the two properties and what the return on that capital is to the city. Whether, whether it's actual cash coming into the city and since these have been designated or interpreted as enterprise funds, no matter how much money the taxpayers ever put in, at least the current designation of the way they're set up says that money can never come out of those funds back to the city. Is that uh, correct. I believe both courses have been put into the general fund. Uh, they're not enterprise accounts anymore. Okay, because it's been represented a couple of different ways right. in the past. Well, in the past, when we first started it, they were enterprise accounts, but no, they haven't been enterprise accounts for a number of years. And uh, I can tell you that, um, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Boulder City or Boulder Creek Golf Course is making money. And uh, Boulder Creek is, um, or Boulder City Golf Course is not. It, it's 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 making more under uh, under the new golf director, but or another way you could say it, it's losing less than it was before. That's correct, but when you combine the two, we'll combine the two, the first the Boulder Creek is making money. So, are um, they are they making money to fund the improvements that are being proposed? Well, yeah, I can tell let's you use, on the let's uh, use just the restaurant uh, expansion as an example. Is, is that restaurant or that property? producing enough money to pay for that expansion. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> the uh, new management is, is less than a year old, but there's been a lot of improvements made. One of the things we wanted to do at this past budget was institute a surcharge, and I think we're still studying that, uh, whether we can institute that or whether the council has to approve it. Um, th that surcharge, the Muni course has that surcharge, and some of the muni municipal course improvements will be paid for by that surcharge I, by the users. I saw that in the breakdowns and, in the line items. And we want to establish a similar type fund 
for the uh, Boulder Creek Golf Course, which is not in existence right now. So that will help offset some of these costs. So there's a lot of plans, but I, it's still kind of a, a new, it's a new management and there's some changes being made. And actually there's some changes. We have a meeting every month and uh, there's a lot of things down the road to be implemented. So he's doing this piecemeal, but it seems like every time we get the financial report, it's better than last year. So we're, we're expecting good things. And, and I, you know, from everything I see in here, uh, down there, especially at Boulder Creek, uh, things are going much better. But what I would suggest then is we need to set up some type of revenue expense thing for the golf courses, we each are. individually, so that we know, well, okay, you made this much money, uh, we can then afford to reinvest in the property. But coming to the city every year and saying, we need this for the golf course, we need that. And I do understand that some of that is being paid for by the revenues that the courses uh, provide. But again, uh, you know, I, I know you've been here more than a year now. so A year and but, a half. Yeah, so you're you're almost an expert on all of this. We're pretty close. But when we talk about spending money at these golf courses, um, that does not go well with a lot of people here in Boulder City. I agree, and um, that's why we are monitoring the profit and loss at each course separately. Some of the projects that we have in the CIP also have been analyzed. For instance, the irrigation system will pay for itself in a very short time. So some of these things will probably be in that, I believe, October 9th, when we get together again, we will have um, rated all of these projects in priority order and you'll see what the criteria was to rate them and we can also get into some of these that you question whether you know we've looked at them and whether the cost benefit is there if if we save a ton of water by by uh, installing a new irrigation system that pays for itself in three years and saves a ton of water. I think that's a win-win for the city. It is, and, and we need to see it in black and white. That's what I'm getting at. We need to see it, mm -hmm. the numbers and all of that, so we can say, here's what happened there. Because what's happened in the past was, oh, the golf courses are making money, don't worry about it, and then it comes out that, well, the golf courses weren't paying for any water. They were getting that free from the city, so they weren't making money. So. Uh, you know, especially with the golf courses, but really with anything, if we're going to say that there's going to be a return on this, we need to have some way of identifying what that number is and not just say, hey, if we throw some more money at this, it's going to be great for the community as we increase people's utility bills and projects don't get done that benefit them and all of that. Um, uh, people are a little bit jaded, let's say, here in Boulder City. We're about, trying to change that. I, I and I say. agree. And that's my goal as well, is to see that it does change. So I appreciate the effort in that. Um, but similarly with the proposal for two soccer fields, um, is the city recreation department still using the soccer field at the high school? No, we're not. And is there a reason why we're not? Well, it's uh, it's programmed out pretty good by the high school. They have a, a women's uh, um, team and a men's team and games and practices. I, um, I live just down the street from there, and, and trust me, there's a whole bunch of times there's nobody on that field. But yeah. well, let, let me ask this. Has the school district or the school said that the Parks and Rec cannot use that field? No. Okay, no. so it is available. It is available, okay. that's correct. The, re um, the reason I'm asking that, Roger, is I've sat on other uh, commissions in, in Las Vegas at the county level where CCSD is not allowing some of their uh, facilities to be used. Uh, I know that's never been the tradition here in Boulder City. We've always shared back and forth with our resources. So I just want to make sure that what's happened in the valley hasn't made its way here. So the field is available then? The field is available. You'd have to make arrangements with the high school to use it, yes. I think the main reason why we wanted to put a multi-use field down at uh, Veterans Memorial Park is we have a lot of um, dog shows on the ball fields. And uh, they come in to Boulder City for two days. Uh, they spend 1500 bucks for two days, which goes into the city's general fund. 
Um, they have dogs on the fields. The dogs do their business on the fields. You have kids playing ball on the fields. And what we'd like to do is try to segregate the dog shows and the dog uh, activities away from uh, facilities where the kids play. And that's what the whole impetus about putting another field in. We could rent it out for dog shows, take it off the, take the dog shows that are currently on, on the ball fields and put them on this uh, field. It would be um, constructed with Bermuda grass with the big irrigation systems. It would use less water and we could rent it out to for a lot of um, organizations want places for fairs and you know the renaissance fair and all that stuff we wouldn't have to worry about staking into the ground and that type of thing because we'd know where all that stuff is um, so that's the the impetus behind uh, requesting a, a new field okay um, and so when you say new then you're talking about something that is currently dirt being turned into grass that's correct okay yeah um, and how many dog shows do we have per year? Probably 11, between 9 and 11 dog shows a year. Okay, think. so that would be somewhere around $150,000 then? Well, if we get to 1500 there's some that pay less than that because they were grandfathered in. But um, we, we do make quite a bit of money from that. Okay. Well, there's money that comes in. But I think you've got four hundred thousand dollars that it would cost the taxpayers going out. So again, it's nice that there's some revenue that comes in. But I think when the residents of Boulder City, the taxpayers, look at what they want their money spent on, it's not investment opportunities as far as our parks and rec go. If there's incidental income to that, that's fine. Uh, I look at the number of ball fields we have here in Boulder City. Uh, we're still a community of 16,000 people, and we have, uh, what is it, seven uh, softball-sized fields here in Boulder City? We have two hardball fields, two regular hardball fields. We bring in a lot of tournaments uh, on the weekends. We had a tournament this weekend coming into okay. town. So um, rather than being a parks and rec, then we're, we're sort of getting into the sports promotion business. No, we're trying to follow the strategic plan about bringing, um, you know, uh, special events to Boulder City, which uh, adds to the, the town and, and trying to trying to diversify our type with our programs. We have a lot of programs that well, use the let, fields. Let me just point out again that when we do things like that, and we have no numbers that I've ever seen as far as what it costs to build and maintain those fields. And we say that the, the reason we have so many of them is because we're bringing business into Boulder City and we never see any quantification of uh, increases in business or any of that. And then we go to the taxpayers and say, we need more facilities. We don't know if we're doing it at a loss or not. And we keep asking them, you know what, Let, let's go ahead and, and invest in this and build this infrastructure. And it's not going to benefit you particularly. You're, you're going to pay for it. But it's for our businesses, and we hear that all the time. It's for our businesses. Um, but we don't know how much it's costing or whether it's actually benefiting them. We haven't built a field for probably 15, 20 years. I think the last field we did was the Hemingway Fields down at... Uh, down at the Hemingway Park, the two ball fields there. Uh, this is the first request for a field in, in that amount of time. So, I mean, it was- And it, I, don't, I don't believe Boulder City has grown in that period of time though. Well, that's that's so it seems that's, that that's true, and that's why we didn't haven't built any fields. But in trying to get the kids, uh, the, you know, get the dogs off the fields, we put this in because this is basically, you know, if you look at the total package, it's a wish list of uh, after analyzing all our facilities, all our programs, what do we really need? And it's up to city council to make that decision if if that's important to you guys or or not. And then that, that's what I'm getting at. In order to evaluate a request like that it's important for us to know are we just throwing money down a rat hole and saying that we're benefiting uh, businesses or, or are we actually doing that is it actually providing a benefit uh, to the community and is it benefiting the people who actually pay the money to do it or are we just taking money from one group of people and trying to give it to another group of people that's the evaluation that I try and make when I look at these projects. Oh, that's a, that's a good evaluation. But I don't and, have a way to evaluate it because right. I don't have anything that shows me what the benefit might be.
Mayor, as the city manager mentioned earlier, last year um, we provided a, a large three ring binder that included all of these projects. Um, with us advancing this a little sooner in the year, we haven't had the chance to fully put that together. We will be presenting that to you before the, the next meeting, including all those projects, as the finance director was saying, kind of a cost benefit analysis on all of those. So that'll I think, I believe that's what you're talking about to help you guys make your decision. Well, you know, somebody eventually should be answering the taxpayers. Yes. Um, they're kind of the people who make all this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the questions I hear. You know, why are we doing that? Yep. You know, how many kids do we have? How many of these fields do we need? Um, is the only purpose of our parks and rec uh, to be I don't know, the business center of Boulder City, that we build and build all these facilities that the taxpayers pay for mm -hmm. and don't use, don't care, and then we say, well, we're going to justify it by saying it helps our businesses. Uh, you know, there's a way to shorten that pipeline. We'll just take money from the taxpayers and give it to the businesses, and then we don't have to do all this other stuff. I mean, if that's the purpose of it. People love the facilities we have here in Boulder City. It's a big reason why a lot of people live here. But if we're starting to say, well, the only reason we're doing this is for the benefit of businesses, uh, it costs us a lot of money every year to maintain these things, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you're both aware. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, Can I uh, make a comment real quick? Certainly. Just while we're on this discussion of the park, it seems to me that a lot of a lot of what I hear from people is because we were talking about uh, dog you, dogs using the park and uh, leaving their mess and stuff like that. And you know, obviously, there's a whole thing about uh, dogs and their leashes. Um, is there currently anywhere any grass area in Boulder City where dogs are allowed off their leash? We have a dog park at Veterans Memorial Park, and the dogs are, uh, are allowed off the leash. I have a, a deal right now that uh, we have been doing since 2015. One of the ball fields at Veterans Memorial Park, we have allowed uh, animals uh, or dog owners um, to use that field with dogs off, off the leash as long as the city is not using it for um, activities such as ball games and whatever. And we post it uh, if we're, we're using it. So there's two places in town where, where you can do that. The actual dog facility, um, C-Spot Run at Veterans Memorial Park and uh, field number three, I believe, which is a softball field at Veterans Memorial Park. And because I just asked, because I'm the, at least what I know, I, I don't go down to the dog park very often. The, the run I see is, is dirt. Is that correct? Yes, there's a pathway around it, and then there, there's a large area on the right side as you're coming into Veterans Park from Airport Road there, um, and that is dirt. That's correct. Um, just, you know, so when we're talking about having this, this big use, we have one field and oh, we'll have dogs there, uh, you know, the dog shows, I guess, and uh, talking about mess and cleanup and all that sort of stuff. But it sounds like that way they're not here, they're there. But I mean, in the end, we're just talking well, about... The, the one, the, um, the, the dimension of the facility on the right side as you're going in is quite a bit smaller than the ball fields. And so, and it doesn't have grass, so that's why the dog uh, dog shows like to be on the grass with the fence with the bigger field. And have we ever? I guess I'm I'm just a little bit curious about the the request for the need for the for the for the additional fields. Like while we're talking about all this, I'm I just I've never heard you. You know what we need more of is more grass out at veterans because it it is quite large and we do already have do we not have the part of the renaissance fair there currently is there have they well, requested they haven't been here for about uh, three to four years so right, but we do have a lot of special events that use the soccer fields for special events okay. but we also use those soccer fields for our football program baseball program soccer program we rent it rent it out to um, um, tournaments um, that type of thing there's a lot of use down there okay thank you also you currently even use a different ball field for the dog. I've, I've seen a couple of the uh, dog events, and those aren't even held at that far left field, right? They're used at one of the regular. Well, normally they, they like to use the hardball field because it's a bigger field than the softball field. And uh, so field number one, I believe, or number two, is normally the one that's being used. Um, 
and then some of the some of the events are using the soccer uh, fields as well and bring fin and brings they bring fencing in uh, to put around the soccer fields and that's where they have their agility tests. Would the would your projected vision of that field? the soccer field, include fencing? It would have to include fencing, yeah. Mm -hmm. and just, just as you were getting ready to leave. Oh, I wasn't going anywhere. Um, the Boulder City Parkway phases two and three, uh, to me, seem reversed. Uh, we've got one going on. That was probably the area that was most in need. Mm -hmm. um, but two, uh, going out towards Railroad Pass, um, you know, it's okay, uh, but if we go the other way, uh, from Buchanan on down towards the lake, uh, that seems to be, if we were going to look somewhere to make improvements, where we would look first, is it too late with RTC, or? I don't think there was any requirements from them of which way we went. Um, I believe we were just looking at going out of town, because it was kind of the low-hanging fruit. It was going to be easier to design a lot quicker to construct, but no, I don't I don't think there's anything telling us which way we got to go. Yeah, because quite honestly, there are folks that, you know, they're fine with, from Veterans Inn, the, the way uh, phase one is being done, but they're not real keen on, on going further out towards Railroad Pass. Uh, you know, we like our undeveloped land here. We like the look of it. Yep. Um, you know, is that really where we want to concentrate? or we've already have development from Buchanan on down towards the lake, um, that might be something we want to look at changing around and, and maybe phase two, we put that money into uh, our residential streets that might be crumbling. Yeah, um, actually gonna try to do both. With RTC having the funding and um, we're like we've been trying to bring everything in-house we're not gonna be able to bring everything in-house but we'll bring as much as we can in-house but rtc will still pay for consultants or whatever else we need so we're going to try to be picking off multiple things at once um but yeah we can definitely look at flip-flopping two and three or three four five whatever it's going to end up being going down the hill um and another thing about bringing stuff in-house RTCs recently mentioned that they will pay for a staff member that is devoted to RTC projects. They'll pay for that staff 100%. So uh, the city engineer, Jim Keene, and I have been talking about, well, if we're going to have to really ramp up this street maintenance program, maybe that's something we look into and just have someone do that year-round. During the, the cold or the hot season, they can be preparing bid documents. And then in the spring and the fall, they can be running crack seal, slurry seal, reconstruction. So... We could definitely keep them busy 100% of the time. Well, that sounds like a good approach. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions from council members? I got one. Mr. Adams? Um, we were talking, uh, it was mentioned uh, city hall redesign. Are we talking about redesigning this particular building? Are we talking about looking at other potential buildings? What? Uh, what are we really talking about here? That million dollars um, was a, a number that was uh, figured for mainly most of that to be spent in this building uh, to, you know, potentially look at ADA compliance issues, to also look at safety and security issues, uh, look at customer service issues. If you remember, there was a total of five objectives that this particular study was supposed to um, address, not only in this building, but then later on that scope change, which was also the condition of the buildings and the maintenance and, and whatnot. Um, so we know, obviously, from having some workshops that this goes from a absolute bare bones kinds of need versus you know the pie in the sky Taj Mahal so we have kind of a range um, but given that range we know that regardless of where this lands even if it's at the bare bones it's going to take some amount of money to address the very basic needs and the basic needs dealing with safety security dealing with uh, customer service flow and dealing with um, um, ADA. ADA. ADA compliance issues. Um, as you know, 
this is the 21st century and if I'm in a wheelchair I can't get to all the areas of this building and I should be able to and so that means that we're gonna have to be looking at how do we install an elevator uh, that has access to someone that's in a wheelchair so they can get to all the all the areas in this in this building so you know we know that we're going to be dealing at least with that issue you know we may not necessarily need to you know be compliant with the sprinkler system in this building but it is the 21st century um, and so if we're going to start looking at these kinds of issues then that is going to require us to meet certain you know upgrade to certain codes um, particularly when it comes to life safety related issues Certainly, I believe access is absolutely important, especially when it comes to City Hall. I mean, that's to me, it's a no-brainer. Um, you know, I, I just I look at this uh, hall right here that we have, where everybody meets, and regularly, it seems more and more, uh, even these aren't enough, and it can even actually be. And I, I learned at our pool pack that it could be a violation of the open meeting law if we don't have enough space that, for what we intended, and um, that's at least what he said. That if if the anticipation, if we could, would anticipate that there would be a large response or a large audience, uh, that we need to make accommodations for that. Um, but, you know, if we're moving towards an, a time where we're having a lot more um, involvement from the community and we're going to be having more people coming to these meetings, I mean, that is something I think we're also going to have to, to look at. And so as, as we talk about all these things and we're saying a, a one-stop shop, uh, I mean, I'm not a design guy and maybe it is possible in a building like this, um, but it, it's also there's there comes that, that point where, you know, I, I'm not saying that this isn't the right building, but at, at what point is this the right building and what point is it not? And, and uh, council member, you are going to go knee deep, probably eyeball deep into the same discussions that staff has been uh, looking at and a number of litany of potential options. Um, none of them, you know, we just don't have all the money in the world, you know, for utopia, but, um, you know, what is appropriate? And from a policy perspective, uh, that's why it's important that at some point the council will be involved to take a look at what are the potential options um, to answer not only the five objectives that we're trying to achieve out of this particular study, but also council's input uh, as representatives of the community is, is this where, um, you know, how important is this for us to start addressing? And if it is very important, the reality is, is, is this the number one thing that we want to do as a community, as the council? Is this the number two? How many years would it take to get to where we need to be if, you know, uh, accessibility, customer focused, uh, safety and security, all those things are important. How do we start addressing these? So... You know, the million dollars seems like a lot. Stand by. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, and certainly I, I believe this is a very important building to, to our community. And it's, I just, we, so we have to be very careful to me, um, especially when we talk about City Hall. What's most important is that uh, the community is involved in that discussion because it's, it's their hall. You know, we're, we're here for them. And that, to me, that is right. ultimately the most important. If that's something that they feel is necessary, then, then yes. But, you know, as far as access goes and all that sort of stuff, I, I just don't think we really have a choice. I think it's something that is sure. absolutely a must. Thank you mind that part of this process will include uh, meeting with the community. And then um, just to kind of um, piggyback a little bit on what um, Councilwoman Folda was talking about as far as uh, design goes and having somebody, and you know, I think it's the, around the turn of the century, I guess I can even say turn of the millennia, you don't get to say that too often, late 90s, early 2000s, you know, we had Damon Olerking in here, we had a lot of, of great, I thought, you know, attention to detail um, when we started, you know, things like bootleg and Adams projects. And there was a lot of things. And to me, it has a more feel of what I think of when I think of Boulder City. And so then, you know, and I feel like sometimes now it feels like as, as we move forward, it's, we're going to, this, this looks this way over here, and this looks that way over here, and this looks that way over here. And there's, it doesn't really feel cohesive. There's not an identity. Um, and I think that's a lot of what, you know, especially was talked about um, prior uh, with the prior council was the need for identity. What is that identity? You know, when you go to towns around the country, Tucson, Flagstaff, you know, the, just in the immediate vicinity, you know, you go there and you say, I know I'm in this town because of the way it feels, the way it looks. Here, there are different areas that have 
different feelings and some of that has to do with just the different time periods at which it happened but I, I think it would be uh, something worth looking at as we move forward and we're looking at all these designs with these street projects and everything like that how are we going to go about doing that and making sure that we have a cohesive identity here that makes this city uh, you know just as special as it really is and as great as it really is I think that's important to, to have that because I feel we've kind of lost that a little bit with, with some of that attention to detail uh, over the last re recent years so I just wanted to make that comment as well I know uh, money is not infinite, and that that it's not it's not it's easier said than done. But I just I want to have, have a discussion. We might have a new graphic machine downstairs at my print dollars. I don't know. <laughs> well, Do you know what that is? <laughs> it's, gov it's government money. It's magic. Exactly. Money. There's always enough of it. It grows on palm trees. <laughs> Thank you, council member. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um, just one last thing I didn't mention was um, any outside funding resources. I know we, we, we use more COPS and RTC, um, but as we're doing some different things that weren't, you know, some projects um, to, to keep an eye out for grants. I know, like, we just approved the um, cameras in the cars for the vehicles for the PD. Um, you know, I just saw an article that Bakersfield had theirs paid by the federal government. So... Um, you know, as we're coming up for these things to, to see first if there's outside sources that could help with it, too. Mm -hmm. yeah, flood control is another one to mention. We just oh, yeah. don't have any projects in the upcoming years. Um, something I was going to mention earlier when the mayor was asking about programs in the past, um, our city engineer, Jim Keene, worked closely with the flood control district to put together their 10-year plan. Um, so that was their map, their guide to mm -hmm. flood control. So that's in addition to the street maintenance and electrical stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then just kind of what was said before is that um, this program is new and to every, like new, new, new. Everyone's new here. So we're all kind of getting this new thing underway. Were the last capital improvement funds for the last five years kind of, I know not all of those were done completed, funded. Um, when these studies happened last year, were those all gone through and, and dropped or put into a higher priority, the past couple improvement funds, say for the last five years? Anyone know how that, how this last year, the first year that you created this map was are created? You, are you asking about like what we're completing this year from last no, year? No, sorry, to make myself better clear. So from, say, 2015, 2019, um, those capital improvements that were proposed and maybe not funded or fell through the cracks, it, did those come back up when you kind of made a master plan last year for the, creating these new master plan, this new capital improvement fund? I, I think there's a number of the utilities projects that have been kicked down the road. Um, I'm not sure about the, a lot of the other CIP projects. We've been doing an annual street maintenance and um, reconstruction, maybe not quite to the caliber that we could have been doing. Um, we've brought more staff on, so we're definitely ramping that up, uh, but I'm not sure about the, the other CIP other projects. Okay. The only thing I'll add to that is I, I believe that we had to start someplace, so we started last year. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of the year, we uh, had to carry over those projects. But then slowly we discovered there's some projects that we didn't know were going on. So we had to add those projects, which were maybe from 2017 or 2016, that you know have gone a span over several years. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're making the CIP more complete with the ongoing projects. So I don't know if that helps answer your question, but we didn't have, there was no one document we could look at in the past. Mm -hmm. So last year was our first starting point, And from this point on, we'll be definitely tracking it. Okay. If I want to make sure that I understand your question, maybe your comment, that there seemed to be some disconnect between previous projects being funded and then all of a sudden what happened to them, they're not moving forward kind of thing. Um, there apparently was somewhat of a practice in the recent past um, where projects that were 
approved by the council, uh, say the top three projects, whatever they were, A, B, and C, uh, came to the council, the RFP went out, the RFP comes back, and all of a sudden the RFP is 30 or 40 percent higher than what the council had approved. And then there was this, well, we have project B that's funded, but we we'll, won't do that. We'll take part of the pro money from project B to make project A whole so that we can move project A forward. So project B then either has little funding left or no funding left because the movie then or the money was transferred. Um, so what we're doing this year, uh, or it's, well, I actually started this last year, is so we stopped that practice. So if a project comes in over budget, then there will be an augmentation to the budget so that it's clearly the council sees what's going on, it is documented, and then going forward, we see how the funds get allocated. The other thing that we also noticed was that there were some projects that uh, had been on a CIP list that w had been developed, um, and those cost estimates were not updated on an annual basis. And that was part of the reason why projects were coming in uh, significantly higher than what was actually uh, in or on the CIP is because those prices weren't being updated, you know, those cost estimates. This year, every year, we go through to the degree that we can and we update those cost estimates with the most latest information that we have available. As we know, you know, labor costs, construction costs are going through the roof uh, lately, uh, but, uh, but we, let, we have to make sure that we, you know, get those things updated on an annual basis so we have the most accurate information to minimize some of these you know, practices in the past where RFPs go out and they bust the budget right off the bat. Okay. Without being too technical, I want to add one thing. Okay. It might be too technical, so I apologize. <laughs> it's the geek in me. But um, in the past, if the money didn't get spent, it would get put back in the general fund. We're also tracking that separately now. Okay. So, you know, it doesn't disappear at the end of the year. So, so I think it's in a way tagged for that certain project. Yes. That it's, okay. Yep. Thank you. No. Um, I'm good. I do have one last thing to mention, and maybe that's what the city manager is going to say, but we do have a public CIP workshop coming up on uh, the 25th. It'll be at 3 p.m., same place. Well, that's what this is, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because I was just about to give the public the opportunity to ask questions that they want. Not public comment, <laughs> but no, we can opportunity do that for them to ask questions. Mr. City Manager, did, did you have something you were going to say? Yes, Mayor, there was. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, going forward, yes, we were going to have a town hall meeting in which uh, we we're going to have kind of an open, you know, much more higher level discussion with the public, kind of identifying the big projects that are being proposed going forward, those that were going to be proposed to be eliminated, such as the uh, significant upgrade to the wastewater treatment facility, et cetera. Uh, but also keep in mind that uh, between now and October 8th, that uh, staff will be finalizing a very thick document that will have every project specifically listed out or to have a fact sheet, you know, uh, how the funding is going to happen, how much we're expecting it's going to cost in design, so forth and so on. If it's multiple funding sources, what those multiple funding sources are and how it feeds into the project. Um, so that way you will have significant detail by project uh, going forward that you can go through at your heart's content. So for every project we'll have one of those. Um, and so you will have that and that will be then uh, you know, additional information to uh, help you be prepared on October eighth. Uh, again, as I cautioned the council previously that uh, this is a five-year plan. Uh, we focused on year one because that's really ultimately what you will approve as part of the final budget is, you know, the expenditure or the approval of expenditure of funds for uh, projects slated for year one. Absent of any significant, and I'm looking at, uh, there's my public works, there's my t utilities director, absent of any significant uh, substantive change that comes out of those studies that we would just take whatever those recommendations are and we will roll them into the next year's CIP and make sure those get incorporated. Keeping in mind that the council will actually uh, be able to see 
uh, the results of many of these studies as to what they're being proposed. You know, if you want to see the pavement management system, we can certainly bring that forward to the council for you to review. Uh, if you want to see, uh, I don't know, it's a manhole cover or whatever these other studies are that are going on, uh, you can certainly see those as well. But the, all those, all that information will be integrated into next year's uh, CIP so that we don't, you know, continue to have to adjust this month after month uh, going forward. Even though this is a living, breathing document, Many of these things will be things that are part of you know, maintenance, if you will, uh, and then we will propose uh, a ongoing maintenance schedule that will um, allow for addressing many of these items going forward in the out years, in next year's CIP. But if there is something substantive uh, that needs to be addressed, then uh, we will be bringing that forward to be included in this year's proposed CIP plan. Okay. I have a question, please. Uh, September 24th. Is that what you're talking about? September 25th? On September 24th, I'll be given the biannual CIP presentation during the council meeting. It'll be oh, okay. ongoing projects, recently completed projects, stuff that's happened over the last six months and what we got coming up. But then the following day is the kind of the round table, more workshop type meeting we were hoping to have with uh, the public. That none of us will be able to attend. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't make the rules. <laughs> yes. Apparently neither do we. So. <laughs> um, quick question. Um, when we get the, these studies back in, is that something where we could potentially have a workshop to kind of go over some of the... Uh, you know, because there's a lot of, there's a big number of, of all these things coming in uh, and it's going to be covering, it's going to be a lot of decision making is going to be based on what comes back with these studies to so just kind of have an overview would be, I think, good some, somewhere where we could, you know, have some discussion. Is it a possibility? Well, we can just ask that, right? We don't need to ask permission for that. We can just ask you for that. You could certainly ask for that, but that's really getting into the weeds and very lot of technical uh, issues. What we tend to do is we take those studies and we summarize those, then we come up with recommendations, you know, which basically will tend to mirror what uh, what the uh, uh, consultants come up with. Also, keep in mind that council that you've created some committees that will also be reviewing these and using these to you know, summarize their recommendations going forward as well. So uh, you know, I'm just wondering you know, how many times do we want us you know, going through this? So, you know, maybe perhaps the process would be, you know, and I believe what, what will likely happen is those particular studies that uh, are relevant to the utilities, will probably uh, be addressed at the Utilities Advisory Committee. And then from there, if there's any significant recommendations, you know, either uh, for or to change or somehow, uh, you know, digress from those consultants' recommendations, then uh, they will likely bring those forward to the committee, uh, to the council for your consideration. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, at this time then we'll open it up, not for public comment, but for any member of the public that would like to ask questions of any of the department heads, please come to the podium. For the record, Fred Volt. I would be curious to know if we have any sort of revenue and expense calculation for the airport. I'm not answering it. <laughs> Could you be a little more specific? In what well, uh, specifically, we're looking potentially at spending $26 million in capital improvements. And so I'm curious For to the know. the airport? Yes, it's on uh, page 13 of your document here, very top. And it's listing uh, six total projects. And so the reason I'm asking There's, about... There are no projects slated, though, for the five years going out. No, but... Those are the needs, but there is no money. No, I understand that. But what I'm saying is, if at some point it's determined that we should spend that money, is the revenue coming in from the airport, the profit, supposedly, going to no. cover all those things? No. Okay. and that's why, that's why there's no funding available to do these projects. These are needs that the airport 
in their estimation, say that they need. Mm -hmm. But then um, I believe we're in the process of hiring a manager there, and then hopefully we can start working with that, that person and um, try to assess how to go forward. Well, then that would lead to, lead to another question, which is... Oh, well, let me add one more thing. Okay, there there sure. is FAA money available, but we need to match. We need to have some seed money there, and we don't even have that. We don't even have an emergency uh, reserve for the so, airport right now. So, Mayor, if I may just interrupt, um, I'm, I'm not sure the process here, um, you know, this is a workshop between staff and the council. Um, um, I don't think it was described that way. I think it was described of... It was okay. supposed to be a workshop. But, but I, I, will, I will say this, that, you know, we do have projects that are identified in the CIP, in CIP they're identified as unfunded. Uh, many of these projects were actually identified, particularly, at, you know, to answer the gentleman's question, uh, came out of the airport um, uh, study that had been done, and, and uh, part of that study recommended a number of improvements that uh, potentially would be funded through grant funding from the FAA, um, including uh, potential um, tower uh, uh, Taxway expansions, those kinds of things. So those projects are identified because they came out of a source document called that FAA or the airport um, uh, summary of, you know, looking at all the improvements potentially for that airport and how those might get uh, particularly funded. So I guess, I guess the answer is that although they're listed, they're unfunded. I understand that, but my question really is, has the city given any consideration to whether it should still be running an airport or not? If we're going to have to put that kind of money, regardless of whether it comes from the FAA or RTC or XYZ, it's all taxpayer money that's going into supporting these projects. Well, it's also a concern of mine that as we talked about earlier, where the federal government will oftentimes come out, give you the money to do a project, uh, maintaining that project then becomes the responsibility of whatever the recipient is, uh, and we ain't got that kind of money, I can tell and you that. The state has the same problem with the public lands issue. If, if it was to take the federal land that is mostly this state... Well, let, let's not... No, I don't want to go there, here, but I'm just saying it's another parallel situation. So, so right now it's unfunded. Right, but what I'd like to know is if the city has done any sort of analysis of whether it makes sense to have an airport? Uh, to my knowledge, that was not part of the study that was done. Okay. Well, I would strongly encourage that that be done. Uh, the other question I'd like to ask is, according to what I've been able to research, for the Railroad Museum, the amount of money that's coming from this bond issue that will be uh, floated by the state from the legislation that was passed, I believe it was AB 84, this last session, the Railroad Museum is to receive $20 million maximum as two years from now or whenever they float the bond issues. I understand that the museum is supposed to cost $35 million, and we have $5 million supposedly coming from RTC to pay for this road. So my question is, do we have the other $10 million covered? So, Mayor, to answer the uh, gentleman's question, the total cost of $35 million does not include the road. Uh, there is actually a third component uh, of that particular project, and it has to do with trails. That is not uh, linked. That is not part of what the city was uh, out uh, advocating to receive funding for. The first two phases of the project, um, one is uh, phase one, which is the actual museum itself. Uh, approximate cost was about $15 million. That is a state facility. Uh, this phase two is the linear park. Uh, the approximate cost is between eight to $10 million. Um, that is that city strip that goes along the, uh, the rail. The uh, street project between design and actual construction, a total cost, and I'm looking at my public works director, if my math serves me right, is about $5 million, $500,000 for design, and about $4.5 million for construction. Um, so uh, yes, $35 million, but that's phase three. We are not looking at phase three as far as any responsibility that we as the city uh, would be looking to help fund. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have questions? Don't be shy. Never shy. 
I'm Greg Todd, Boulder City resident. I was looking at the uh, project for the Adams uh, to Buchanan through Boulder City Tap uh, 69 KV uh, pole replacement. And I would recommend as a suggestion that we cut that into more than one piece. We need to get the Boulder City Tap transformer working first, and then we should go from the Boulder City Tap to substation three. That would be the first segment I would get in because in conjunction with that piece, we're gonna be doing the 69 KV loop, which is supposed to be coming, I think the material is supposed to be coming in the first of next month, some of it. So with that, we could then start working on the next segment of the 69 KV section, which would be from substation three replacement to substation two. All right, we'd have more usable, more user selectability and the ability to keep the town running while we're working on these high voltage circuits. And that's what I'm recommending, not just taking it all as one chunk from the Boulder City tap all the way out to Buchanan. So that's all I have to say on that. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, um, we will then move to the official public comment period. Uh, this period is for any issue. Is there anyone wishing to speak in the final public comment? All right, we'll go ahead and close public comment then. And again, very much appreciate the work staff has done on this. And we are adjourned. Thank you.